Boom. Go get his podcast. We're here with a local legend. <laughs> Greg Screp. What's going on with you, big man? How you living? Everything's well. Living fine. Yeah. Getting her done. Yes, sir. What that is, I don't know, <laughs> yeah. but we're getting her done. <laughs> I guess we're all trying to figure it out, huh? Amen. Yeah. All You're walks of life. Entire life. Yeah, you know, spend your lifetime trying to figure it out. Yeah. Do you think we ever do figure it out? Uh, I don't I don't necessarily think we figure it all out. I do think we figure some things out and uh, Yeah. Bits and pieces as you go along. Amen. You know, that's all you could you know, work on. You know, yeah. it's all about improvements. It's all about learning. It's all about moving forward. And yeah, I think I think for the most part, I think we get comfortable mm. to a certain extent, and then um, you know it could change. Yeah. But that's all. That's what it's about. Well, yeah. uh, thanks for letting us in your house today, man, to film this podcast beautiful for sure. It's a, yeah, literally a beautiful place you got here. Well, um, thanks for you know having having the interest to put, you know to put me on. Yeah, for sure, man. Uh, is there something you think like that's special about this city that's keeping you here? Well, this is home. Mm. You know, and, and speaking of you know how things change real quick, um, you know, you guys know a couple years ago uh, uh, the school districts you know yeah. combined the schools, yeah. and so uh, <coughs> that certainly has changed my life. Mm-hmm. And uh, but it was really why I probably stayed around here because. You know, when I went to school at GAR, we were mm. a community-minded school. Um, everybody knew each other on, on the hill, and we had, uh, you know, we had a nice rivalry with Myers, and then, you know, also Coughlin, we all got along off the field. Uh, occasionally had a, some, you know, some in- incident, <laughs> but uh, we still got all along. You know, on the field we had a great rivalry, but it was fun. It was fun, and it was home, and we are all family, and we knew each other. And once that went, I mean, I spend, I'm 52 years old, and then for 50 years of my life, GAR really, yeah. really played a significant role in my life. My kids went to school there mm. as well. My mother went to school. My dad coached there. And then all of a sudden, it's gone. Yeah. And it's like, it's been weird ever since. And then a couple other things have happened that have really changed my life. But uh, I, I got to say, it's just that I, I believe that this area was, was just a homey area. Yeah. So do you think the combination of the three was a net negative or a net positive? Well, I think uh, I'll always like the three, you know, three yeah. high school system. Uh, but is it realistic to support it? Uh, is it realistic that it, you know, we could fiscally uh, keep it up? I guess not. And, yeah. you know, from what I've under, I, I've seen so far, the new school certainly has the facility, certainly mm. has the it technology. It is beautiful. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, I, I, I support it. You yeah. Know, and these kids um, – could you imagine being a player today, going into that gymnasium, mm. you know, with the basketball, and now you see the football fields just about ready to, to rock and roll from pictures. It yeah. looks unbelievable. Boy, if you can't get excited to play, you know, now, mm. you're not human, I don't think. It's beautiful, man. I get to see it every day. I actually, I still work there for, like, that school, the Wilkes-Barre High School. I am currently employed there, so I get to see it all the time. Like, that field and the gymnasium and all that, I can only imagine what it's like, like how much that would fire you up to play somewhere like that. But at the same time, I think part of what made playing for, like, Myers, because we both played for Myers, so fun. Sorry about that. Oh, it's all right. <laughs> Last year, man, yeah, we got him, yeah, though. we ended out pretty well. I think well. we're up on the scoreboard, too, if you look up <laughs> yeah. who has the most wins. <laughs> but, yeah, it was something about, like, I guess the tradition to the whole thing and, like, knowing, especially, like, when it was all coming to an end, that last game, that there was, like, years of, like, blood, sweat, tears, emotion that was poured out. There was, like, something to that. There was, like, we had big – shoes to fill it seems like with this whole new school thing they have an open book they kind of get to have a fresh restart and they get to just go about the future forward no, no doubt they got a, a fresh restart and that, and that's nice to a certain extent yeah. but you know there is a comfort with you know the tradition of of myers gr mm-hmm. and coughlin i mean and people yeah. it really meant something to a lot of people i mean everywhere i went especially in, in you know in the height section of town in the gr section of town there People were sad, yeah, you know, and, and and rightfully so. You should be sad. I mean, it's a, a, a large part of our lives, and it was gone. I mean, I can't now tell my kids, and, and, and they themselves can't tell their kids, yeah. hey, there's our school. Let's go see our high school. It's, it's not yes. there anymore. Well, it's being used for a middle school, mm-hmm. but, you know, the you know the banners aren't there, the yeah. championships we won. It's just not the same thing. And, and as, as good a job as I think the school board did in trying to, you know, create uh, a, a great atmosphere for the new school and stuff, mm. people are still going to miss it. It's like, you know, yeah. losing a loved one. You're st- you know, still gonna, it means a lot to you, and it's still gonna, you're still going to miss it. Yeah. That had to be the hardest part for me in the whole transition thing was just being able to still, like, to this day, walking past that school all the time and it just being a shell of what it used to be. Like, all the energy and whatnot that had filled those hallways at one point, even if I disliked going to the school, like, just in terms of, like, the schooling, uh, 
it's just the energy that used to be in that stadium, like walking past it and knowing that it'll never be there again. That's like, I think what gets me more than anything about the entire uh, combination. But I, I do think like for the future, it should be a net positive. It's just being that I got to play for both of them. It was kind of a weird experience in that regard. Yeah, that, that that would be weird. So you were with the first graduating class of, of Wolfsburg area? No, actually, I, st- I graduated at Myers, okay. but I was a part of the first team for okay. the Wolfpack, and I was on the last team for Myers as well. Okay, okay, I, I got you. Yeah, so th- that was real interesting. But, yeah, I, I mean, in terms of everything, it's just like walking past, like, those those uh, walls outside of our stadium and just knowing that the energy will never be the same in there again I think is what gets me more than anything about it. Yeah, it, it's certainly um, it's weird. Yeah, it feels weird. I mean, I mean to me, it was always about relationships, and we were so close at GAR, and and we knew each other, each other, and yeah. even like you know the you know the school closes, but the city you know it, it's changing too. You mm. know the different people are coming in, different cultures are coming in, setting up shop, and different families, and you don't really know the names like you used to. Yeah, and it's just. You know, you, you think back to it, it's a little melancholy, you know, you get a little emotional, but you know what? You know, you have to move forward too. It's, it's exciting at the same time because there's something new coming. Mm, and, that's true. And so, you know, they do, like you said before, they do get to now write their own story. Yeah. You know, there's it's a fresh piece of paper, it's a fresh book, mm. and, you know, the, the story's just, you know, just starting out. Yeah. They yeah. have a chance to do it way better. Like Absolutely. I think that, that's one thing that is a, definitely a net positive about the whole thing is they have a chance to make it way better than it was ever prior. And they probably have a lot more opportunity as athletes, too. Oh, because yeah. The way that like the competition that they're playing is much higher. And it's, they might get a lot better exposure as well. Yeah, yeah. The only thing you fear is, is, and what I've seen is, everyone always talked about, boy, could you imagine if all the athletes, you know, from all three city schools yeah. combined, mm-hmm. that we should have a powerhouse. And it sounds logical, but yeah. it seems in the early, you know, the years of the new school, we're not getting, you know, the participation mm. we're accustomed to. And so a lot of people aren't going out for whatever the reason. And hopefully coaches, I, I think, you know, Wilkes-Barre, the, the uh, football team has really started to see a lot of participation because we got a, a lot of uh, ups, uh, upstart young coaches. Uh, I know, I think you guys interviewed him, Damon Sachs. Yeah. You know, yeah. He's, he's a guy responsible for now getting more interest in, in uh, you know, in, in football at a younger age. Mm. And so these kids could go up um, – from any parts of the city yeah. now and go to school and, and, and play. And hopefully that that's what's going to happen. I was hoping it happened sooner than mm-hmm. later. Uh, unfortunately, um, for whatever the reason, it didn't. But there is that potential there, and I look forward to seeing that potential. And like I said, I support it 100% and, uh, and wish, you know, wish the Wolfpack well. Yeah, he's, he's definitely taking a unique route, Coach Dame. He's uh, <laughs> trying to build these kids like from the youth up, not just trying to get them at an age where they're already, say, programmed one way or the other, and it's hard to you know mold them to your program. But he's taking these kids at a young age, showing them a lot of love, and I think he's showing like, great success with what he's doing. I hope that he gets a better position at some point. I mean, we had talked about that on the podcast. He wants to open his own school one day, which seems that seems like a wild – it's it's, yeah. it's extremely out Crazy. there, but – if that would ever become a possibility, I, there's nobody I'd rather see do it than him, especially with the touch, like, to the youth that he has. I think that that guy has great potential as a coach. Well, he not only knows the game of football, he knows what the game of football does for people, especially mm. what it did for him. But you know what? The bottom line is this. He cares. Yeah. And that's I, – I don't care who you are out there. If you care and you care about these kids, that's that's bottom mm. line. And he has that. And he yeah. cares about those kids and what happens to them. Uh, and, and he cares about their future. He mm. cares if they get in trouble. He cares yeah. if they're on the right path. And, and he knows such so much because he's been so you know, through so much. He he played here at, at Kings and, and had a heck of a career. And he's just a, you know he's what we need. Yeah, he's definitely yeah. what we need. He's a he's a he's a gentleman and, and and a guy that I have a great respect for. And so that's the kind of guys we need to get. Involved. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, Josh Mason is one of those guys too. I think absolutely, this area. absolutely. No you know, doubt. We have those guys, too. We have those positive outlets for mm. kids to go to enhance their abilities as well. That's so important. So you guys don't have the, the benefit of, of living when I did because uh, high school sports was really a big thing when I played. I mm. mean, it's so big that sections in the newspaper were dedicated, you know, more than they are now. Yeah. And you'd have those individual stories. And you plus you'd have, especially in football, you'd have guys – you know, move on, you know, to, you know, colleges and you would get you know, those exposés and you would see what they're doing and mm. you see what's happening. And it was fun. It was neat. And you could see what's happening. 
lot of people don't know where other guys are going now. Yeah, they I agree. don't. They yeah. don't get the you know the the media attention that they used to, and, and a lot of budgets are cut. Digital you know media has certainly you know put, taken a bite out of that. Yeah, John Mandela does a wonderful job of trying to, to move it forward. I know Steve Bennett with the the Voice tries to do the same thing, but they're very limited. So yeah. um, it's nice that you guys are actually doing the podcast because I think it'll bring light to. You know, people and individuals that are really, really willing to put out, you know, the effort and get involved and, and do it for the right reasons. Hell yeah. With all the experience that you've had playing football, like your whole life, have you ever considered coaching? I did coach and uh, I, I thought everything really, really went well. I took over a Bishop Hoban team at the time that hadn't won in three, three games wow. in three years, I mean, and my only goal was to win one game. And <laughs> um, we did do that. We probably should have won a couple more, but we had to learn how to do it. And I'll tell you what, those kids at Hoban were tough kids. They were tough-minded <clears throat> kids, uh, and, and they put forth an effort. And, and I think just that one victory will, carry, will, will be with them the rest of their lives. From there, I did go to Crestwood High School, and, and you know, um, we did coach you know, five years up there, and we were yeah. doing some good things, and, and everything was going well, unfortunately. I uh, called an audible in the middle of my life and wanted to spend more time uh, with uh, my new position as a county commissioner at yeah. the time, and uh, I had to give up one of them. Mm, and see. unfortunately, it was it was football because I had a family to raise as well, and I needed some things to go yeah. forward with that. And <clears throat> unfortunately, I did. But yeah, I did. Uh, I did coach. I enjoyed coaching. I think it completed my athletic career uh, as a as a player. You know, when mm. you get to coach. Unfortunately, I'm a little beat up right now. I don't know if I should yeah. stand on the sidelines yeah. and, and, and give you the, I could, mm. I could certainly uh, be there from a mental capacity, but a physical capacity, I don't think yeah. I have the, you know, the, the wherewithal to stand on the field for mm. the, you know, for the, for practice and to do this. Um, yeah. yeah. It's a commitment. pretty beat up. Oh, it is oh, a commitment. Yeah. Yeah, and these sure. guys who do it, you know, uh, they certainly don't get the recognition they deserve. Uh, but you know what? Uh, the kids who are being, are, are being coached for them, certainly will, will, will understand. Well, how about, like, a lot of the, the older guys, you know, have a way of saying, you know, back in my day, we were much tougher. Do you think there's a difference in the mentality between when you were playing versus the co- the kids you were coaching, you uh, know, as you retired? And I do. I, and, and, and you know what? And it, this is not a knock on today's, you know, today's athlete, but we were tougher. And we were only tougher because we had to be tougher. Yeah. We're, we, you know, here's the what the deal this is what happens now we spend hours upon hours on the field there was no overview or like there was no the rules aren't the same as as they were then and we just went on and on and you know what it was either you had to be tough or you left you didn't Mm. play and that was my whole career you know we went from you know uh, at gar to michigan to the raiders to carolina we were physical, physical times, you know, we beat each other up in practice. And you know what? Eventually, you're going to toughen up. Sure. We practiced for hours. At Michigan, we had th- literally three and a half hour practices um, every day we were on the field. Coach Jim Beckler, who I played for the first three years, and Gary Moeller for that, you know, extent, which I ended up playing my last two years for him, their philosophy was simple, that if you didn't hit during the week, somehow you were going to forget how to hit on Saturday. And unfortunately, um, for your body and, and your yeah. psyche later on in life, you're going to be beat up. And, but at the same time, I remember sitting in a practice with uh, Coach Moeller, and we're up uh, in a veranda looking over practice. And I said, Coach, what's the deal? He goes, Greg, you guys were just tougher. I said, come on. He goes, just look at the practice. Uh, and it looked like more of a Chinese fire drill. And this was, you know, five, <laughs> you, know, t- you know, this is probably five, eight years ago. And, and, and I realized, yeah, and it was just because they weren't doing what we did. Because yeah. if they did what we did, they would be just as tough. Um, but unfortunately, they didn't. And, and, but it's a good thing, too, because they found out that football, you know, has some great risk. And so they backed off physically and mm-hmm. gave these kids some time and so forth. And unfortunately, it has changed the game. These kids are phenomenal athletes. They're unbelievable, have unbelievable quickness and speed. But they don't necessarily have that repetition that we had sure. that makes you tough. Well, like, I think the game has evolved in its own way, too. Like, you see, you guys, I think, as the as the team was set up, were more bunched. And as I think the game evolved, it became more spread. There's more such, there's more thing as a spread offense. And I think um, there's also more of a finesse, I think, today. Kids are moving quicker. Flashy. And, yeah, like, there's a flashiness more, to it. So, like, during practice, I see, like, they're not hitting as much, but they're 
doing different types of drills. Oh, no doubt. There, there's I mean? no doubt. And, and you know, again, it, it don't ever take me wrong. I'm not here um, to disrespect what's happening. I'm just telling you, you right. know, honestly, you know, the difference between today's game and yesterday's. Mm-hmm. I'll give you a perfect example as an offensive lineman. When we're an offensive lineman, when I played, the emphasis was on the running game. The running yeah. game is all about physicality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, you know what? You had to learn how to pass protect coming out of a running stance. And it's very difficult. When I first started at Michigan, we played right and um, left. We played quick and we, strong and weak tackle. Strong tackle basically meant you just went with the tight end. You were yeah. in a formation of tight end. You know, the, the, weak, you know, the, the weak side tackle, Jason was um, – uh, he didn't have that tight end with yeah. him. And that's all it meant. But when I went to the left side of the ball, where my senior year I finally would put my left hand down on the ground, I would have my right hand on the ground. And trying to pass protect with your right hand on the ground really changes the game because your footwork is screwed up and yeah. skewed. You actually are losing a step on probably the premier defensive player on the team, which is usually the right end, which is plays across from the left tackle, the guy who gets millions of dollars now, yeah. who's as fast as you know some of the receivers are. Mm. So it, it's a big thing. But today's game is geared towards pass blocking. So mm. these, you know, the the players are now in a pass stance. Some of them don't even put their hand on the ground. And now they have to learn how to run block from that past stance. I see. So yeah. it kind of flipped in a way. It, it flipped in a way. And with the, you know, you, you know, the, the linemen become more of a basketball player who has to move their feet left and right. And, you know, so they're not as physical. Although I will tell you this, a guy like Mark Lewinsky, who's a GAR grad, mm-hmm. he's an old school player, old school physical player and kind of a throwback. Mm-hmm. And he makes it work. I mean, he could do it very well and, and mm-hmm. has made a nice living out of it. But then I see another one of our kids, um, uh, McGovern, Connor McGovern from Lake Lehman. He does exactly, he, he gets in front of people. He has great feet. He could play, you know, offensive guard. He could play tackle. He could probably even play center. So, you know, the athleticism shines out. And, and centers today, you know, they, they pull around yeah. the ends and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, you could see the difference in the game. It doesn't make one better or one worse. It just the emphasis is different. It is and, a bit and different. So yeah. you have you have th- those differences. When you when you played in the league, did you guys bang in practice, or did you guys like was it <sighs> all the time? Yeah. I mean, Art Shell was my first head foot coach, Hall of Fame offensive lineman. So you're going to tend to, to to listen to him. And it wasn't like uh, Buffalo was the uh, was probably the leading team at that time that would would cut camp and and you know, take you out of practice. But we were generally always in pads. I remember um, before one in one time before our preseason game, we were in full pads. Uh, and we're banging each other the day before a preseason game. And the rule of thumb is, and think about it, you can only play one game of football a week for a reason. Yeah. And yet, when right. some of these practices were just like games, especially for offensive linemen, and you were beat. And that was one of the things that probably struck me as odd. You just never knew when your body was going to you know, feel good. Yeah. Uh, and f- you know, cr- interestingly enough, it seemed like it happened on a team basis. When you finally felt good, the whole team felt that way. Mm. And, but when you kind of felt bad, the whole team felt that, that way as well. So there is a correlation. There was a correlation, and today they certainly have proved that you can play football without being physical every day of the week. You can play football yeah. without beating each other up during the week. Uh, and you could play very good football. You know, so, mm. yeah, it is definitely different. But the game in, its, in itself stays the same. It's still, you know, it's still basically – the bigger, stronger, faster guy wins, yeah. and, and that's how it Car works. Car crash every play. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Unfortunately. Well, they're spending so much money on the players these days that I think that they can't risk injuries as much as they used to. Well, see, that, see that's, there's a philosophy there, yeah. too, where, where you know, if, if, you're, you know, if you're worried about getting injured, mm. that's when you get hurt. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's when true. you get hurt the most. And you know what? I, everyone understands why they do it. Um, you know, the, the, you'll see that in preseason games, you know, where a lot of teams, I think I'm a big Philadelphia Eagle fan and I could see, you know, one preseason, they hardly even played during the game and they started out really sloppy and slow. Yeah. This is the year after they won the Super Bowl. And you know what? You still got to play the game of football mm. to get good at the game yeah. of football. You got to get the timing down. You got to get your body prepared. It's just the way it works. Um, and you have to get the reps. It's like lifting weights. You notice that if you ever you know, on the bench press, when you got your hands in the bar, your you know your your top your tops uh, the bottoms of your fingers will callous. Yeah, 
that's, you know, basically your skin getting tough to, to take care of that, you know, that mm. bar all the time and mm-hmm. not rip or, yeah. or do anything like that. So ultimately your body has to get prepared like that. And the only way you could, could get prepared is you got to take some hits. Yeah. You got to get it, you know, used to. And now, you know, you have that, you know, controversy to playoff time. Do, you know, do you rest the guys or don't you rest the guys? I think at, when I played, I think the week off was a great thing. Yeah. I think now it really doesn't matter because I think I actually think it's a, a detriment because I think the team that continues to play is the team who has the advantage. Oh, yeah, it's definitely, like, I think it's better in all aspects of life when you have the ball rolling. If you take a break in anything, it almost seems like when you come back, you're way sloppier than you left off. Yeah, a lot, well, a lot of the guys, too. I mean, most of the guys, you know, back when I played would probably stay around, you know, continue yeah. to work out. The guys now, I mean, they're literally taking, you know, their time off. And, and which philosophy is mm-hmm. better? I don't know. But it's certainly, if you do take time off, it's good. There's going to be, a, you know, some issue because yeah. it's going to take a little while to come back. It's definitely recoup time. You can never just hop right back into it. That's where I thought you were going with the whole uh, bench press thing to begin with. Because I've noticed that if you're, say, consistently hitting like a chest day once or twice a week, every single week, you will consistently go up. If you even take like a week or two weeks off of doing it, you come back, you're doing good amount of weight less than uh, you normally would. For most guys, it happens yeah. that way. But there are those freaks out mm. there oh, that, yeah. you know what, they could just go in the weight room yeah. and bang out 225 mm. 30 times anytime they want. It's, 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 it, it's crazy. But that's... That's talent. That's mm. the difference. You mean some guys have that, some guys don't. Yeah. Some guys could prepare this way. And that's a probably a, a, a good point for each and every guy. There's some similarities, but most people are different. Mm. And you have to find a, what, what works out for you. And, and I would probably tell any youngster out there the greatest piece of advice I could give you, never compare and judge yourself to somebody else. That mm. was my problem, I think, in high school, man. Yeah. I think I did that a lot. Well, I think my kids, you know, got unfortunately got uh, unfairly compared to me, mm-hmm. and they were totally different athletes. I mean, yeah, yeah. they were big and, and, and stuff, and there was a little different time period, but, you know, they're not me. They're them. You know yeah. what? They're, you know, so let it yeah, And so, yeah, you're, you can't compare yourself to anybody else because everybody has you that unique difference that makes them them. Mm-hmm. Sure, yeah, there's some things that you can do that are going to be similar in, in, yeah. in all instances, but... You got. You can't. You know, sit there and say, mm. "Well, I got to." You know, this guy got away with that. Why can't I? Because yeah. you know, like you know, like I said, this guy might be able to go in, into the weight room and you know bench three hundred pounds, yeah. even if he doesn't. And you would probably go down if you didn't mm. you know, bench every week and 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 do the reps every week. So you can't get into, you know caught up in you know what they do. You just got to do what works for you. Yeah. Speaking of that, though, like when do you think that your desire to become a pro athlete? started in your life and how do you think that you've maintained that through some of the uh some of the trials and tribulations growing up in Wilkes-Barre City (laughs) I think I've always wanted to be a pro athlete I think uh you know my dad uh, was a big sports guy I think he instilled a lot of that in us uh he would always tell us that you know one of the big things that when we start playing he says I don't mind uh if you don't want to play next year but you're never going to quit during the season last the full season uh, and you know what, when you play athletic, you know, sports, you learn a lot, of, you know, in terms of, you know, teamwork and competition and, you know, going out there and excelling and, and learning what it takes to play the game and mm. stuff. So, uh, I mean, for a very young age, I, I was a Philly fanatic. I love the, you know, the Phillies, the Flyers, the Sixers, the Eagles. Um, and some of the teams weren't really that <laughs> good. In 1980, the Eagles did go to the Super Bowl, but end up getting, uh, you know, beaten by the Raiders at that time too, which was I think the first wild card team ever to win a Super Bowl was wow. 1980, and and the Eagles were heavy favorites going into that game. Um, mm-hmm. I remember Jim Plunkett was the quarterback. I don't know if you guys know Jim Plunkett, but he I think won a, a Heisman Trophy out of Stanford, and he was our radio guy oh, <laughs> at the wow. time. And he was sitting on the plane. He's right next to me, and I said, Jim, you know what? He goes, he goes, what's Scrap? What's up? He goes, I said, I hated your guts when I was a kid. <laughs> and he starts to laugh. He goes, why? I said, I was an Eagle fan in 1980. You guys beat us. And he start laughing. And it was funny. And, and, and so, but that's the things that you remember. And then um, I loved the Sixers and Dr. J and Daryl Dawkins. Yeah. And, you know, they, they were, you know, they won it finally, you know, and they're the only one other team that other out of four teams that won a championship in the 80s. Yeah. Uh, Phillies won one in the 80, you know, a big, big super fan. I probably go to more Phillies games than anything else. Yeah. And then Flyers, I mean, they were coming off their championships in the 70s. I don't really remember them, but I still was a, a big flyer. Yeah. And you know what? I always dreamed of being on one, you know, one of those teams. And then 
And when I was younger, I probably leaned towards basketball more, but mm. my body was geared towards football. And most of my offers were coming in, uh, you know, for football. But it took me a while. It took me a while to, to, to grow into my body. I was probably very clumsy and mm. uncoordinated when I was younger just because I was way too big too fast. And by the time, you know, everything started catching up around ninth grade. And so um, yeah, I would play varsity sports, uh, you know, both – uh, all three sports, uh, football, basketball, and baseball. Unfortunately, I never played hockey. My dad never would let me tie up in the uh, <laughs> the uh, hockey skates. And we had an ice rink right across the street wow. from where I live. So never got to. So I just enjoyed watching you know, mm. that. Um, and But you, you watch and you really get competitive. You play. You want to emulate what you've seen. Uh, I think probably one of the biggest travesties today is I don't think kids watch as much as we used to watch. I mm. mean, we used to watch all the time. Yeah. That's how you knew. That's how you, you learned. That's what you wanted to be. Yeah. I think they watch highlights in the ESPN, yeah. but they get that, you know, that six-second clip, and they think that just happens overnight. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. So, you know, I would go, and, and I got a lot of attention from um, – a, a lot of schools, specific. I, I could have probably went anywhere I wanted to uh, to play college football. Although I did have some Division One offers from you know basketball, and the one that came before my senior season was Drexel mm -hmm. from Philadelphia, the Drexel Dragons. And you know that's probably a little known fact that a lot of people don't understand that I did have a, a an offer, and I did play baseball. And, and one of the, the the Pittsburgh scouts would send me letters here and there because mm -hmm. I had the wrist speed uh, uh, to be able to hit. I don't know if I necessarily could hit a curveball or not. <laughs> <laughs> that gave me a little, but I could hit the ball yeah. a long way, and I had the wrist speed. My coach would always told me I had the wrist speed to, to be able to hit in the, in the Major League Baseball, but I, I kind of was delusioned a little bit to think that I could play in college, and, and my coach kind of led me to believe I could, but, you know, really, realistically, I couldn't. But you go in, uh, into a place like Michigan, and, you know, you just it grows. It feeds off you. And I could tell you about an offensive lineman. I didn't sign up to be an offensive lineman. I remember the very first day of practice. I couldn't play peewee football. Busted my butt off. Unfortunately, I was too big. It, it put me back a long way. So I wouldn't be able to play football until I got into seventh grade. When I went to seventh grade, I didn't want to be an offensive lineman. I remember when we started to separate drills, I think I start running towards where the tight ends were, you know, where it went. Cause every I, line every is, dream, yeah, every yeah, I wanted to catch dream. the ball and, you know, <laughs> even throw the ball. I wanted to throw the ball. And now they said, you're going with the lineman. And I've been a lineman ever since. However, you know, there's, it, it's like an acquired taste. Being a lineman's an acquired taste. Mm. And as you get older, you truly appreciate it. And, and I, I, as you get into it, I loved it more and more and more to when I got to the NFL. And even you know, even now, I'm glad I never – I was always a lineman because mm. of just what the position does and, and, and how it manifests itself. So – and you just you – know, it grows on you and you love it. Yeah. And right now, it's like you have kind of a love-hate relationship with it because you're beat up. You know, we have issues now and, mm. and issues that they didn't recognize at the time that we never thought we'd have, we have. And – it is what it is, um, and you know it's sometimes you're you're, you're torn. You're, you're torn between you know, hey, would I let my kid play? Um, is it wrong for me to love it because I still love it? I, I, I do still love it, and, but it's something that just you know builds and builds and builds. And, and you know what, when you compete, I'm 52 years old. I can't do much physically in terms of competing, but you, you compete in other ways. I mean, you find a way to compete. Uh, a friend of mine, Steve Wisniewski, who I played with. With the Raiders, he he's from you know Penn State, went to school at Penn State, and he always talks about we got to unleash the warrior within. That warrior within, never you never lose that. Mm. Uh, and you know, oh, yeah, it, it I love just that. yeah, you got to tap into that warrior within, and and you know what, that's probably what we try to figure out now. That's you know where could I be a warrior? And it doesn't necessarily have to be a physical thing. It could mm -hmm. be yeah. a mental thing. It could be. In, in helping others it could be um you know in any in your jobs and your faith and in, in, in what you do uh, casually or socially i mean where's that warrior come out and it's nothing more than you know trying to tap into the, your best and compete and, and and to be your best and that's all it's about i agree i love that man that warrior spirit i think that's within men i think that's a thing that men have within them and i think uh I think it's necessary for us to tap into that in any way we can to, I think it's more or less like a directional thing. Like we need some sort of purpose or direction and something to move towards, like maybe a goal or something. 
You know? Well, yeah, well, the greatest question of life is, you know, purpose, you know, yeah. it's, uh, what's your purpose? And that changes, you know, you, you're going to change, but you have to find it out for yourself. The biggest mistake that a lot of people do, even parents, they try to force that purpose on the people. you got to let it right. organically develop for each person. Yes, yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't develop um, for the, at the same speed and the same rate for a lot of people, but you have to be willing to let it go. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a really f- faithful guy, and, and, and I would just say, trust God. You know, here's a plan, and move yeah. forward. And, and so it happens at everyone's uh, you know, own pace. And, um, yeah, as a parent, you, you want it to happen a little faster because sure. you yeah. want people to get, you know, um, you know, you want them to be a little responsible, get a nice job, mm-hmm. be careful, you know, you know, set themselves up and this and that. But <clears throat> you got to, you know, like I said, you got to trust it to where, you know what, they have to live their individual uh, individual they have to walk their individual path and they yeah. will find their way and but that's about the warrior you know where's that warrior that warrior doesn't come out everybody at the same time and, and you know that purpose is like i said that's people spend their entire life trying to find it and you know if you don't find it that's tough but once you do look out yeah man so you think that you're in that stage of your life now? So you retired, and you're not doing sports anymore. <laughs> you're not coaching anymore. You think you're all, you're you're once again looking for a new direction to take? Oh, I know my direction. I, I'm pretty, you know, sure that I know my direction. It's just how to uh, bring it out now. You know, I, okay. I, how do how do I uh, what do I do now with that direction? I'm a faith based guy. Um, I, I'm a guy who believes in, in, in you know God, you know Jesus Christ, and so forth. And I don't want to make this show you know, about religion, but that's who I am. Yeah. And, and I know my purpose. I know helping people is always what I wanted to do. Uh, mm-hmm. I think, you know, the problem with today's world is sometimes the focus remains too long on yourself. Mm-hmm. If you're a, a man of faith, you know, you know, the, you know, the purpose yeah. usually focuses on others and yeah. it makes you feel so much better. Uh, I remember and the, probably the oddest place I've ever heard it. I went in to see Dr. Malcolm Conway to get some you know, adjustments. Shout out to Mr. Dr. Conway. I loved him. Conway. <laughs> there you Great go. Guy. Shout out. Yeah. Uh, and we were in, in the office, and he's you know giving me some therapy. My lower back was killing me. And we're talking about depression. He goes, Greg, I said, he said, depression is pretty simple to deal with. He says, just go out and do something for somebody else. And it's very hard to, you know, to have depression when you're, you're doing something for somebody else because your heart then gets filled with gratitude and, mm. and you're helping somebody and you have a little purpose at that time. But go help somebody else. And you know what? Yeah. It, it seems to be so simple. And, and yet so many people have a hard time just to, you know, just to see because, you know, this world pushes itself so much. And, you know, the my, my greatest accomplishments and, you know, you know, the greatest thing that I've done for myself is help others because there's no doubt in giving is in we receive and I've received my greatest um, joy from helping others and, yeah, then, and so that's the passion I have now. But how do we get that done? That's you know that's where you know where you have a little bit of confusion. There's a book on that called The Go Giver that I haven't read yet, but I think it encourages the reader to let go of your ego a little bit and let go of your sense of self a little bit and then prioritize being more generous with your time, with your effort, and with your energy and like try to help other people. I think that's like where a large uh, like piece of happiness and, and gratitude comes from by being able to do something for her. And I, and I highly identify with that. Sometimes we get so caught up with, you know, thinking about ourselves all the time, you know? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it sucks. You can dwell on it a we lot. We get too. consumed with our own self. Mm. Yep. Well, I mean, the greatest, you know, there's two greatest commandments out there, love God and then, you know, love yourself, you know, love your neighbor like yourself. Yeah. Well, everyone looks at it and says, well, love your neighbor, but there is a part about yourself. So mm-hmm. you have to, you know, love yourself. Sure. Yeah. Just now take that love and, and, you know, and show somebody else that love and your neighbor is anyone you yeah. come in contact with. And so the greatest thing, and, and you talk about ego, we all have egos. I sure. mean, come on. I mean, we're athletes, athletes, yeah. especially we all have yeah. egos. Mm. We all, you'll think we're never going to get beaten. You know, I never thought I ever got beat. I just think that, you know, I never thought I lost the game. I just thought, you know, I ran out of time. You know, that's how we think. Yeah. You know I, mean? I love that. Um, yeah. Never, you know, we ne- never, never lost. I just ran out of time. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. You it's know, you beat. And, I, and you know, even if, you know, you're going one-on-one and, you know what? Hey, let's do it again. Let's do yeah. it again. Let's do it again. We'll do another rep. You're another rep. You want to compete and you win. And that's a great thing. People mm. sometimes shy away from competition, but it's the greatest thing for them is to compete. But the ego, I mean, we all have it. And um, the greatest word I could probably use to counteract that ego and, and what, you know, a, a faith-based people are, is humility. Mm. You got to be humble. 
And, yeah. and what you find out, if you are not humble in this world, you will get humbled. And unfortunately, some people get humbled all the time, and yet they do not recognize it. Mm. Because somehow that's when the blame game comes <clears> out. It's somebody else's fault. It's never me. I never look myself in the mirror. Uh, it's, it's somebody else's fault. This is what happened to me. They did it, not myself. Mm. But if you're a humble guy, understanding you know, that um, it, it's not always about me, and then you just try to spread love, I mean, and in love gets so misconstrued you know, about being some mushy, gushy feeling that you have for a spouse or a girlfriend or a boyfriend and stuff. Love is a, is ultimately, in me, in, in the way I would tell you, is a choice. Yeah, it's a choice to spread good and to spread kindness and to mm. spread compassion. That's a choice, and that's a choice that you have each and every day. And if you're humble, you'll understand it. Unfortunately, um, there are, you know, we, we all go through it. There's those time periods that, you know what, uh, we get lost. Yeah, you know, man, that's unfortunately. a definite fact. That's crazy. So did you always have this? I didn't expect this coming in here. I thought we were going to come in here and it was going to be like meat and potatoes. But this is, I like this stuff a lot, man. I think it's very, very necessary. I think that we need to have love within ourselves to be able to give love to other people. Oh, no yeah. doubt. No you know? doubt. You have to find that in yourself first before I think you can show love to other people as well. But, like, in my high school career, man, like, you know, I got a little bit of attention, um, and I, it got to me. You know, yeah. I thought I was the man, you know, and I thought I couldn't go wrong, and I thought, I, you know, I couldn't be beaten. Mm. And then when I would, you know, experience some real competition, I didn't know how to handle it. I don't think I had developed a necessary amount of introspection. Mm. you know well that's that's with age and that's yeah. with maturity and, and so forth but I when I was in high school I, I kid you not I, my senior classmates would tell me I think I was in the newspaper almost every day my senior year <laughs> and I got so much attention yeah. and I got so many recruiting letters in, in all aspects I did all I also did extra, extracurricular activities I was in these club that club is in the guard choir sang solo went to the district course I mean but I was always, it, I never felt better or worse than anybody else. I just, you know, did it. And unfortunately, I got this attention. And I, in many instances, I felt uncomfortable with it because I thought that all my other teammates, all my other classmates deserved just as much as mm. I did. And unfortunately, I got a lot of it. And I look back and, and I'm proud of, you know, what I've done and stuff, but I still have never been totally comfortable with, um, you know, with getting those accolades. And trust me, I'm proud of it. And I have an ego just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also, like I said, I don't think I'm better than anybody else. At the same time, I don't think I'm worse than anybody mm -hmm. else. But um, it is interesting. And unfortunately, I always had a strong sense of faith growing up. It's probably one of the biggest things um, that hit me and I could remember back, you know, that's what hit me the most. And it's developed through the years. And uh, I've seen things that I, I'd rather not, you know, which I didn't see, but I also experienced things that show the greater side of mankind. I mean, especially when you're on a team, it's nothing greater than being on a team. And specifically, there's nothing greater to be on a football team. I still have my friends from college and, the, and, and pros that we talk. We are all in, in uh, um, text groups and stuff. And these guys at the drop of a dime would still be there for you tomorrow. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we, at Michigan, we have this group called For Those Who Stayed, which ultimately is, you know, players raising money for other players in need. And, and, and to me, that's, you know, you, uh, that's one of the things that I'm, you know, probably most proud of right now because, you know, when I was in need, people were there for me. And, I, you know, you just want to pass it forward and, and move on and so forth. So, I mean, you get to experience. And I really have seen, because you get so dragged down by what you see in the press and what you see yeah. in the news and what you see in the media and, you know, see this crazy stuff that's going on. But you really, you know what, I've really seen the greatest in people. And, I mean, life and death situations, I've seen people just come to the forefront. We had one guy who ultimately was given a death sentence from a, a doctor that, you know, we got together, we raised the money, and right now his cancer is, is in remission and he has a positive outlook. And that was five, six years mm. ago, which he was – supposed to be dead, you know, less time wow. than that. So that's the great part about it. And I think there's a lot of people out there that understand exactly what I'm talking about. And there's nothing greater than the spirit of a team. So when you're out there looking, stop necessarily, you, you have to look at yourself individually sometimes mm -hmm. because you have to be, you know, the best part you could be. But 
look at the you know look at it at the perspective of being in a team you know what whether it's just overall general mankind whether it's being at work whether it's being part of your church group yeah. whether it's being part of you know an extracurricular activity a band whatever there's so much neat stuff out there and there's so many good people out there let's focus on that i'd like to see this focus on that because um since the COVID, it just seems like we've been divided further and further. Yeah. So, yeah, man, it's also like um, I think that's a, a Western thing as well, individuality and in, uh, in the self. I think in the East they practice community and and connectedness much more. Yeah, well, I, I there is there's a lot of benefit for certain people when they separate people. That's just the yeah. way it is. There's yeah. a lot of benefit for people, and unfortunately, you know, we get so caught up with those differences that we forget to see the similarities and then mm. we allow the person who was uh, you know really pushing that division to, to allow us to go wider and wider and wider and and really if you look at i i've the great thing about football too is that you get to learn about a lot of different cultures a little sure. races a lot of different uh, you know you know, differences you have with other people. It's the greatest thing. I mean, at Michigan and in the pros, you play with so many people, so many great people from so many different areas yeah. of not only the country, but even the world. And if you really, you know, want to enjoy it, you know what, just go out with them once or twice, mm -hmm. you know, have a, have a conversation with them, go eat with them, go to their house here and there. And that's what, what I was able to do. And I'm telling you, you, those differences now don't become threats to you. And actually it becomes actually pretty cool. I mean, it's it's really neat to see how other people do it. I mean, yeah. I'm a Eastern European from you know the Carpathian Mountains, the, you know the foothills of the Carpathian the Mountains. You know, so, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So, but when I, you know, I went, my one of my best friends was a Mexican guy, uh, and who would you know was from Texas that ended up in Chicago. We used to go home for the holidays with him, and you know, his whole family was there. It was uh, great. The Mexican food. Uh, best tamales I've ever had. And you know what? It was great to see something different. It wasn't something I was afraid of. It was something that was very similar. They were the same kind of family that I had, and yet it just expressed in a different way. And that's the kind of stuff that you love seeing. That's the kind of stuff that I love being part of. It's probably why I travel a lot because, you know, in different parts of the country, you get, you know, you just get, mm. you know, different experiences. Oh, what's, yeah. your, what's your favorite spot that you've traveled to in recent years? I don't, I don't think I could tell you I have a favorite because I like it all. Yeah. Um, you know, recently, most people probably didn't travel when, you know, with, because of the COVID. I think I probably traveled more during COVID than I did previously mm. because there wasn't much else to yeah. do. Um, I went to, you know, California a couple of times. I went up to Boston. My buddy lives in Austin, Texas, which is a, is a great, you know, town, uh, really known for its outdoor, um, is outdoor. Yeah. Uh, you know, but also known for live bands you know mm. and it's a young you know because uh, not only is it the state capital but it also is what the university yeah. of texas is so there you get a lot of differences a lot of uh um, diversity so it's pretty cool california you Rough might place. not like how it's run and this yeah. but it is so beautiful man oh and yeah you could go from skiing one afternoon down to the beach mm. you know uh, you know the same you know five hours later yeah um and you know the countryside into the big city it's just so much to do and if you ever just you know drive up and down that state on on, on the interstate you, you was it at uh, the pacific coach High, pacific coast highway man beautiful yeah i uh, went down to florida you know a couple of times um you know uh scheduled to go to uh mississippi a buddy of mine uh he has in a band um i forget what casino it plays uh, plays in and I'm going to see him play in this big casino. I'm also supposed to go out to the, you know, Vegas uh, soon. Um, my other buddies in in Washington. I would love to visit mm. him. But we, you know, this is the stuff that I went. You know, we traveled all over in the country. Barcelona, Spain is. We played in Barcelona. Uh, and one of the exhibitions uh, games when I, you know, was it probably '92 or '93? Was shortly after the Olympics in '92. And I loved Barcelona. Yeah. But I do. I love culture. I love art. I love. Um, I love the mm -hmm. tradition, uh, you know, and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's easy to get lost, but there's something for everybody. Everywhere. Oh, yeah. And whatever you like. I mean, some people like the mountains. Some people like the you know, beach. Some mm. people like, uh, you know, the water. Some people, you know, like a you know, big city. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's out there for the taking if you just go out. Because I, I think one of the worst problems that you could have is if you just kind of just get caught up in the mundane you know, like routine of everyday life. Oh, yeah. And then people get stuck. Like, people get stuck in places that they don't want to be. Do you ever see yourself, like, do you ever think you could see yourself living outside of the United States? 
Uh, I, yeah. Me and my friends, we talk about that yeah. a lot. Um, what, would I like to travel abroad to where I spend significant time in other countries? Absolutely. Mm. I don't know if I could see myself uh, living there permanently. Yeah. Um, but there's, you know, I would certainly like to go to the Middle East, of course, because of faith-based reasons. Mm. I'd love to go to and, and trying to schedule to go to Istanbul, which, uh, you know, it was back. Um, it was Byzantium, which was Constantinople, which, you know, my faith has a lot of roots there. Um, my son's girlfriend has a lot of roots there, too, so I'd certainly love to go mm. there. Of course, uh, who wouldn't want to go to Rome and visit the Vatican? Yeah. But, you know, the history of everything that goes with uh, Italy and stuff would be wonderful. Um, I'd love to go to Ireland. Um, Ireland, <laughs> they say, is such a pretty country. It's I, I, a lot of, of course, I know a lot of Irish people. You know, certainly my mom's side of the family was Irish, too. And every time you come back, they come back with these beautiful pictures. And mm. it just things you yeah. see in the movie and stuff. Um, in fact, I have opportunities possibly to go to Iceland. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's through the University of Michigan alumni. And that's the cool thing about that is that you, you could afford some opportunities. And I might take them up one time. I just got to get myself feeling a little better, you know, yeah. get in a little better shape and, and, and I'm gone. But um, I'm an American guy, man. I, I love America. And there's, oh, yeah. you, could just, you could just travel throughout this country and be in awe. Oh, yeah, there's, there's so much out there for you to discover. I've really only been to about, like, f less than 10 states myself, so I definitely want to take down a lot more states in the United States before I, like, venture outward, but I could definitely see that being a big chapter in my life, just traveling the globe, maybe take a few years off of, like, ventures and just go out there and live life for a little bit. Yeah. Well, you, you live it every day, so, I mean, uh, uh, people, you know what, will, will think that they just don't have the time mm. or, the you know, the money or... Uh, you know, they don't want to put forth the effort, but I, yeah. I have found that doesn't really take much effort. It's just a mindset. Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine, you know, she could probably tell you <laughs> uh, every, every cheap way to do mm -hmm. things that you could possibly can. And there's a will, yeah. there's a way I, I, I live up my life and I always have is just open up opportunities for yourself, mm -hmm. go and experience other things, take yourself out of, out of your comfort zone sometimes and just create those opportunities. Whether you take them or not, that doesn't matter. It just create them. And, and whatever opportunity you want, you know, it'll be there for you. But you have to be willing to experience it. And, and, and unfortunately, a lot of people close their minds to it because they do get caught up in the mundane routine of everyday life. And to me, I think that's just a boring life. Yeah. It's yeah, like yeah, being man. comfortable. A lot of people get trapped in that rut. That's one thing I, I try to force myself to not, like even just in regular days, like not being comfortable, not just like laying on the couch, watching YouTube, doing whatever, like stuff like that is, it really clouds my mind and it takes away from my pro my productivity like tenfold. I can't do and get done everything I need to get done in a given day if I'm just focused on being comfortable and having a good time, this, that, and the third. But uh, yeah, it's definitely a big problem for me. Yeah. I I got to stay focused. I got to keep my mind moving at all times. I c yeah, I can't get trapped in that rut. You want to pass me that, Darren? Yeah. The uh, <laughs> interestingly, uh, I have you know put myself in a lot of positions because I'll tell I'll, I'll I'll tell people yes all the time. Yeah. yeah. I'll do it. I'll do it. So when the, the events come up or the, you know the thing comes up, sometimes you're like, oh, why did I say yes? Why mm -hmm. did I do this? Why did I'm tired? I don't want to. <laughs> but then when you go. You, you come out of the event saying, man, I'm so happy. I'm yeah. Here. I'm so glad I came. I'm so, you know, it was such a rewarding experience. And, and that's what I think people get, you know, scared of is that, you know, Hey, yeah, you do get tired. You don't really, you know, you kind of some days you just don't want to do it. But when you force yourself to do it, you find out, man, not only did you have a wonderful experience, but more, more likely than not, you've met some great people. Yeah. That, uh, you know, many of them will be friends for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. That's very true. That's like yes theory, that YouTube page that you follow, right? Yeah. They have this philosophy where they just say yes to opportunities like that. Jim Carrey, the yes man. Mm -hmm. oh, <laughs> right. Yeah, no, the, it's yes. a group of YouTubers, man, that just, they literally, they just travel around the world asking people to do wild things, like things that you couldn't even imagine, like flying across the country to stay in, like... For example, I was telling them a story about a castle. They would just, they rented out this castle where they would just go around. I think they were in New York City just asking random people, hey, like, we'll fly you guys out to this mysterious place. Uh, they kind of gave them a little gist, like a rundown, but didn't tell them the full story. And if they were willing to block off a weekend and say yes, they got to go out. And without knowing, they'd be staying at this castle that they rented out for a weekend. And uh, it, was, it was a crazy experience. But they do that in almost every video. They just go around asking people to, Try to convince them to say yes to wild experiences. And a lot of times, a lot of the people will. 
and it turns out to probably be a memory they'll never forget. I'll go to a castle, man. I'd oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah so Without me. knowing, though, like, yeah. imagine somebody just randomly walked up to you in the streets of, like, the square of Wilkesbury, and they were like, hey, like, good. without, yeah, without telling you very much, like, <laughs> yeah. do you want to fly out to this place at this time? You got to block off a weekend, take a couple of days off. You might not see your family. These guys could be murderers, you know what I mean? You never yeah, really well, know. I mean, yeah, you got to be careful, mm. but, yeah, but, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, Medieval times count. <laughs> like yeah, I would no. I, I would love to do. I, I like to think like I'm very open to doing things like that. When I met, had mentioned this to them, like I'm a very spontaneous person, so you can ask me to do a lot of things. Chances are, I end up saying yes. Even a lot of things I don't want to do, I'll still end up forcing myself to do it. And I think it just opens so many doors oh. for you. And you know what? You, you give yourself an experience that you never ever could have imagined. You oh have. yeah. And it open. You know what? It it can change your perspective. Mm. I went to. Uh, I had a, there's a kid on um, our senior football team who was a foreign exchange student from Germany, and um, him and I got really close. We had a lot in common, and he's an Asian guy. So like it was weird that from different back, completely different backgrounds, sure. him and I can have so much in common. Oh no! It was doubt. almost like he was like my German Asian doppelganger. Nice. It was like, so weird. But then uh, he went back home, and I always expressed my desire to travel to him. He's been literally all over Europe, and uh, he told me that his mom would buy me a ticket to go to Germany and stay with him for three weeks. And I just said yes. And it was nice. literally the coolest thing I've ever done in my life. We also oh. went to the Netherlands. We went to Greece for five days. Nice. Like, and it, I, I came back like a completely different person, it seems like. Mm, like my perception cool. is so different. And I would, I, and we do, we just backpacked. Like I remember in, Gre uh, in Greece, I mean, we ate oranges, bread, and peanut butter for five days <laughs> nice. and just stayed in hostels. I don't know if I could last on that. <laughs> yeah. diet, but my, my niece did the same thing. She, she uh, backpacked throughout the whole country. And my dad was, was stationed in Germany. He always had fond memories of Germany. Mm. Always. In fact, he played football in Sembach, Germany. Oh, really? Yeah, he wow. played on base football. In fact, he could have actually went to Florida State, but, it, you know, uh, some things happened that just, didn't, you know, mm. he didn't want to, I don't think. And the one coach that took his film – um, was going taking his film back to Florida State, you know, passed away in a uh, plane crash, and you know, I think just oh, wow. things got crazy. Wow. But I think he always wondered what would have happened if he if he did take it. But nonetheless, he still had fond memories of Germany. Even if you get in the service, that's a great thing about the service is you get to travel yeah. a lot. Oh and yeah, you you need to go into another country to just to see that. You know, I think one of the things we take for granted as Americans is the freedom we truly have. Yeah, we could agree to disagree. We could, uh, you know, we could really. You know, uh, pretty much, you know, uh, argue about anything, and and you know that's the beauty of this country. But in in different parts of the world, you can't you can't have that freedom to even agree to disagree. You can't have that freedom to, you know, say what's on your mind. Yeah, and believe what we you want just, to believe and everything. Right, yeah. and we just don't understand. We are so free that we have the opportunity, to, you know, to do it, and it just gets caught up uh, in in the wash because. People don't understand that not everybody has that. Yeah. Even just with the right to vote, there's people out there that would give their life to, to have that right to vote for a free, you know, free and fair election. And yet some guys, some people here won't vote because it's just eh, one of those things. It's yeah. what you're going to take it yeah. for granted. Let's not vote. No, no big deal. And, and unfortunately, um, I, I, I tell my kids, I said, listen, voting is a way you say thank you to the people who gave you that right and who yeah. continue to give you that right. And I think that's uh, important. And there's certain things I think you, you need to do um, to, to, to say thanks to what we have uh, because there's so many people out there that don't have it. How oh, crazy yeah. is that? It's kind of paradoxical in a way that we're <coughs> so free that we almost cage ourselves. We, you know, listen, come on. We're, all, we're always restricted by the boundaries we create for ourselves. Oh, yeah. About that, I mean, uh, most of this conversation is talking about, you know, basically been talking about getting out of those boundaries. But we do box ourselves. I mean, people are imprisoning themselves on a daily basis and don't even understand it because they've, they've, the bars are created in their mind and they can't get out of it unless they recognize it and they don't. Uh, unfortunately, that's just the way life is for some people. But you know what? That's some of the things you could help people with. Hey, get out of that, you know, get out of that cage that you put yourself in and, and, and try something new because you never know what when that a person has that aha moment. It could come mm. in the strangest of places. Yeah. It could come, you know, just driving down the street. It, I mean, I remember, you know, there's a lot of things I could tell you that are good, bad, or indifferent, but 
I remember, you know, coaches. And the game of football has given me so much. That's one of the reasons I can't really hate it too much, you know, because it's you know, certainly taken some things away. But I'll always love it because there's something at 52 years old, there'll be things that I'll think about with football. I'll, I'll pop in an old film. I'll see an old uh, uh, notebook or I'll, I'll see an old playbook and stuff and then realize what some of these coaches were trying to tell us and do. And then all of a sudden you say, ah, now I get it. Yeah. You know, only if I got it when I was 22, yeah. 23. Yeah, 52, I can't really do much about it now, yeah. but uh, but you can. You, you could pass it on and you could really you know, you could really, you know, say, "Wow, understand." And this is they weren't just trying to beat me into the ground. They weren't mm. trying just to win football games. They really were trying to help me in a different way and and that happens all the time. And he, I could tell you this and and Many people won't even understand it. When I played high school football here in Wilkesboro, I thought the coaches, especially the coaches I had at GAR, were just as good a coaches that I had throughout my entire career. Now we we didn't emphasize uh, you know, a lot. You know we you know we were we were simplistic in our points of view. We we uh, rep- you know we did repetitive things and we were good at what we did. But our coaches were good. They knew the game of football. Charlie Fick, you know, Galella, you know, all these guys, they knew what the game of football was about. And they, they taught it to us. Uh, I remember Charlie Fick was a math teacher. He said, you know, and he would always bust and, and say, he said, listen, nobody's having a contest on public square for math equations and people don't show up to, you know, do the, they come to show up and watch football. And, and, and it was funny because he wasn't bad, you know, wasn't knocking mathematicians. He was basically saying, hey, listen, people want to watch what you do. A lot of people can't do what you do, but they love to watch what you mm. do because they know what it takes to do it. But all our coaches, even our basketball coach, my baseball coach, Simon Peter, was as good a baseball mind as there is out there. And, and so, you know, it helps us. And, and we had really good coaches that were dedicated to the cause. And um, it's one thing, you know, I see differently here is that some coaches don't understand there's a lot of time you have to put in. That's what makes a, co- a great coach is just putting in time. It's like being – it's like being a good parent. I don't know what it takes to be a good parent, but I can tell you this. The one thing it does, you know, that is involved is just give them their time, you know, be there for them, you know, be present at their events, be there, watch them grow up, you know, participate with them. And that's what it is. Give them your time. And that time you will notice you know, more and more as you go on, you'll realize who gave you their time. And it really gives you a wonderful perspective on people and what they've done for you and what they sacrificed for you. That's wild, man. I mean, the the whole the thing you're saying about time, uh, shit. <laughs> I'm I'm going off the ladder right here. <laughs> it's crazy how how um, how philosophical like our sport endeavors are, and how and how oh, much yeah. they relate back to life. Like recently, I got into mixed martial arts. Uh oh. And uh, yeah, right. Uh oh. <laughs> Talk about humbling. <laughs> yeah. But it's crazy how you could take some of the lessons that you learn on a field or on a court or on a mat. And you could take that into your real life. Yeah. Isn't that nuts? Like how uh, your coach can tell you something and, can, and it can apply to a million different things. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of what he was saying with time. Though, like at some point, it just takes that time to like be able to apply it through like life experiences and yeah. things that you learn. Like at first, a lot of shit might not resonate with you right away. Right. You might just think they're just, you know, talking your ear yeah. off or trying to get you to repeat a million things so that you could you know, fundamentally understand a movement yeah. or, a, or, or whatever it might be. But it actually, it's like Mr. Miyagi, you know, how <laughs> in each of his lessons, yeah. he's like he, there's, there's something to have to do with life there as well. Yeah. Wax on, wax off. Yeah. You know, I mean, who thinks, you know, waxing a car would have any kind of application towards being a you know, good karate student. Yeah. But it all, it, you know, you'll find that just about everything you do is always relative. It's all relative to everything else. Mm. Uh, you could be reading, like, like I said, in the strangest, you know, places, I never would have imagined, like Dr. You know Conway is a perfect example. I mean, I wouldn't, you know, went in there to talk about philosophy and and you know something is you know and being depressed and then I'm just hey just do something for something other. I mean, you just have to open your mind to it because a lot of people close their mind to it. But that's the football probably greater than any, anything else. And I did the miss mar- you know martial arts thing too. And um, Sam Hyder was a, a my instructor and you know. I never got a chance to play football. I was actually going that direction to get back in the game. Mm. It never happened, but I was so happy to have the experience because it pushed my body to limits I never thought it could go. I did things that I always questioned about myself, which, you know, uh, it was fun to, to find out. Uh, and, and we did things that I never did in football, and it was a neat experience, even though it didn't have the outcome 
that I wanted to have. But football, there is so much correlation to every day in life. I mean, you learn so much. Uh, you learn so much about yourself. You learn so much about others. You, you learn how to deal with things as a team. You learn mm. how to prepare. You learn how to, you know, to discipline yourself. You I learn like how to too. work hard. You know, there's because in football, you can't hide in the game of football. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you have to work your butt off to get to where you need to go. And you know, I, could, I actually would sit down and, and realize and some of the things you learn. I probably filled up three or four pages of no, notes. And I, it's probably laying around here somewhere about what the game actually has done for me. And yeah. At 52 years old, there's really not many days that you know go by that the game of football hasn't influenced my life in some way and most days in a, in a positive way. It has opened my life up to experiences and more, more importantly, it's opened my life up to meeting great people that... Um, you know, that truly make me a better person. Because at the end of the day, it's all about what makes you better. Well, you know, someone was asking me, do you, you know, are you going to go to a place, are you going to go to a place that's better? And I said, no, I don't necessarily look at going to a place that's better. I look at going to a place that makes me better. You know, uh, and uh, people need to look at that. Because if I'm better, then I know everything around me is going to be better. And then um, I could accomplish my goals in, in helping other people. And, and, and I will tell you this, a simple hello as passing somebody mm -hmm. could mean the world to somebody. I mean, it could, you know, it could change their lives. I just recently made a phone call to a friend who was, who was down and out because he had, uh, had just got a medical diagnosis that was, you know, disturbing to him. My me just reaching out to, to call him meant so much to him mm -hmm. that it changed a lot of his perspective and gave him a little bit of a pep in his step. And I think, you know, provided him with a little hope. And that's the power that you have. That's the power you have. I remember when I was running for office, um, and this is football again, you know, this is football. I run for office, and then we're done. My first, you know, first election was just about over. It was the eve of the election. I think it was the, the first primary I was in. I went to TJF Friday with two friends of mine, um, and we sat there, and there was this lady there. And she comes up to me. She goes, Greg, I got to thank you. I said, what's that for? She goes, I think you saved my mother's life. It's like, how, how did I do that? She goes, well, my mother was in the hospital and I asked you to sign an autograph or you gave an autograph picture for her and she was always a big fan and you signed it, you know, you know, something nice and you put your name to it. I gave her the autograph picture and from the second I gave her that picture, her whole attitude changed. She was happy. She had a lot of energy mm. and I, she goes, I think that was the reason she got better. She, you know, they, they changed everything about it and I kind of had, a, I, it brought a tear to my eye. Because it was just a small gesture of kindness, just a simple act of kindness. I mean, no, no one's name means anything on a piece of paper unless the person you know that's getting it likes it. Yeah, I mean, that's the whole thing. And this to think that that little act of kindness, that little gesture, changed a whole person's attitude to where it propelled them to getting better from their illness. Wow. I mean, could think about it. I yeah. mean, it's like I said. Listen, I didn't, you know, do that, but thanks yeah. anyway. And I, and I literally teared, you know, fell down my eye because you don't realize the power you have. Now that's football in, in a little bit. That's the power of football, but that's also the power of just being a person, mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know what you can bring to a person. Because consequently, I think we've all been in a situation where you know what we've been angry. We've been, you know, you know been a bad day and we snapped on somebody oh, yeah. and certainly uh, put that person in a bad way mm -hmm. and you know so it works both ways but I'm trying to focus more on you know just the positive thing and it doesn't take much a hello a sign of yeah. the name uh, and just say hey just calling to say hey I mean it, it matters it Act does matter matters. acting that way too positively affects your mind and body way more than you can ever imagine too well there, there's a book that I have there and it's, it talks about the secret life of water I don't know, not many people may have um, heard of it or not. I would suggest getting it. It's mm. a great book of philosophy and so forth. But basically what it, it talks about is it, they take water in three forms. You know, they're trying, it's about crystallizing water. And ultimately, you know, the bottom line is when they, as they crystallize the water, they put it in three different atmospheres. One atmosphere, you know, what basically was a positive, upbeat atmosphere yeah. where you're talking good things to it, all this stuff. Hey, this is good. Today's a good day. You're going to do great things and so forth. One, they put in an atmosphere where it was more negative vibe, hey, uh, you know, mean, nasty mm -hmm. stuff. And, and the other one was neutral. 
Okay. And what they found out that the water that was being talked to positively crystallized more beautifully, more you know, uh, readily, you know, solidly, yeah. and, and the best than where the negative side mm. was the worst for the crystallization. Yeah. Now, the uh, the one with no um, uh, no stimuli mm. was ultimately yeah so so, but it, it says you know what it so the bottom line is. And when you think about it, your your body's seventy percent water. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When you're you surround yourself with those positive vibes and those pilot positive stimuli, you're gonna feel better. Oh yeah, hell yeah! I saw a study very similar to that, and it had to do with plants. Yeah. And it was they had three they had two subjects. Uh, subject A, they would um, give it positive affirmations as they watered it, sure. and as they gave it sunlight, and they gave the same. Plant B, the same treatment, but just with negative affirmations. Right. They would curse and say, you're an ugly plant, and all this other stuff. And the one plant grew beautifully. It, it yeah. had good uh, flowers, and it grew green, and the other plant mm. didn't seem to grow as well. It actually had mold yep. growing on the plant yep. and in the soil. Yep. And I think that that's very interesting, because I think that uh, that ties into maybe some of the deeper aspects of life that we might not understand, really. You yeah. know, like vibrations and, you know... Um, and energies and things like this, you know. Well, think about it when you played. I got a little, uh, yeah, well, yeah. Well, experience well. city action going. Yeah, on. hopefully all is well. <laughs> oh yeah, that'll be yeah. a big spike. Yeah, yeah, but think about when you're on, you know, playing experience. Unfortunately, the one negative part about my team is I grew up in an era of negative reinforcement, mm. not yeah. only in coaching but also in parenting and so forth, and it really has had an impact on me because. Uh, it's, it's difficult to, you know, because I don't really get to enjoy what I did well. And, and, and I have to actually go back and look. And, and all I remember is the plays I screwed up on because that was the emphasis. And if you were in the film room, you know, you know, they would always, you know, roll back the one you didn't do too oh, good. hundred times. Yeah, yeah. So, and then the one you, you, you just crush the guy, you know yeah. what it's like. Next oh, play. Yeah, yeah, next, yeah. All right. You know, they, <laughs> they, they may mention, hey, all right, yeah. Scrap, good job here. Let's yeah, go. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like, <laughs> wow. So. All I've ever, you know, part of the, you know, growing experience was you know, <clears throat> kind of concentrate on what I did, what it, mm. what I didn't do, rather than what I did. So I mean, look at what it does in your own life when you're around that negative stimuli, and it, it really changes you. But when you're around that positive, you know what it, it makes you feel good, and and you know, there's a, a, a difference. So you can't really let it go to your head, but it certainly makes you feel better, oh, even yeah. when you're trying to get healthy. You know, you're trying to, you know, change your thing. You get around the pod, your body responds differently. Mm. And um, it, it, it just feels better. That's why you can actually, you know, through eating and, and through, you know, just positive, you know, stuff that you could you know, could really change, you know, the physical aspect of your life. Very much so. Yeah. And even like, uh, I think, you know, you probably see a lot of people who've had maybe miracles, you know, because of stuff like this. I know it's changed me for the better because... Um, my body's beat to shreds and, you know, inflammation and a lot of inflammation in there and a lot of good positive changes that I have made. And, and, you know, you could feel a difference. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's what I look to go out and, and, and surround myself with. Cause it, you know, you get to a certain age and you realize, you know what, enough of the nonsense. I'm going to put myself in the best possible position I yeah. can, best positive position I can to be a, the best person. I, you know, that's, that's the goal is, you know, you got to go out there and be uh, one of those guys I follow uh, you know, it's, it, he has a group called Dynamic Catholic, and, and he'll refer to it as the best version of yourself. Yeah. So what's the best version of myself? Because if I, like I said before, if it's if I'm the best version of myself, it's only going to help other people around me to be the best version of themselves. And then the experience of what you have becomes true joy. I mean, because yeah. we all, you know, you could, all, you could be happy for moments, but true joy is your heart is filled. Mm-hmm. Your heart is filled with, you know, joy i mean that's that's what you that's the goal but when you want it filled all the time your happiness comes and goes yeah you have happy moments you have sad moments you know you're angry you know you're, you're confused i mean there's all different kind of emotions but true joy is when your heart is filled and that's what you're looking for you fill your heart and it, you know you're not going to fill it with uh negative experiences or negative stimuli you gotta you know fill it with positive and you're gonna really feel true joy if you could feel true joy man you're on the right path yeah man i think uh I I experienced some of that. I I got a dog recently and um, and I'm trying to train this dog. And I noticed that when he would piss in the house or when he would do something (laughs) like that, I'd be like, Jack, look what you did. Like you, and I noticed that that didn't do anything, you know, for the dog's development. And then I I started to look into this and uh, you know, praise can do a number for a person or a dog or Mm. whatever. If you can positively reinforce someone and show them what they've done well, right. It, 
it helps them tremendously. You're right. You know, yeah. and uh, I think that that's really beautiful too. And I think that at some point it is important to recognize like, how can I live my best life? Like, how can I live the most healthy life that I possibly can sure. beyond the physical? And uh, I went through a rough period as well where I think I was experiencing depression and anxiety. Sure. And I even still experience some of those things. But um, in my recent life, I took up reading and I took up uh, meditation. And I think that that has helped. And, and also eating mindfully as well. Like right. you know, pay, paying attention to what it is that I'm putting mm. in my body and how that might affect me, you know, after I consume these things. And um, it does a number, man. It's, it's, it's something that I really don't even understand, really, how it affects our psychological uh, systems and so mm. on. It's really yeah. interesting. Well, I mean, uh, you say something, you just said the term, you know, it's mindful. You know, mindfulness is, you know, is another thing. And ult- ultimately, being mindful is having all your senses there in the moment mm-hmm. because how many times are we ex- experiencing something but our minds are somewhere else mm-hmm. oh yeah or we're you know fiddling with our hands or we're doing this um you know and sometimes it's a nerve i'm probably fiddling you know, all the time with my hands you know just a handsy kind mm-hmm. of guy you know i talk with my hands a lot but you know what if your mind's thinking something else you might be writing something down but your your senses are all over the place yeah. so that if you're mindful about something all your senses are in the moment you know, they're experiencing whatever that situation is. If you're at a sporting event, if you're at a concert, if you're in, you know, in church, if you're uh, taking a class, you're there, you're present. Mm. Everything, your mind, your your senses, you're seeing things, you're hearing things, you're, you're smelling things, you're feeling things, you're, you know, taste, everything is there. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it really, it, you know, it changes the whole perspective of everything because you're allowing yourself to be there in the moment. And it's, it's crazy. And, you know, then you get to that true joy. You, that true joy, like when the Grenadiers pound on the Mohawk. Oh, that true joy. Back of to that. that feeling. It always boils back to that. <laughs> <laughs> that true joy of, of when, you know, the, the the kids on the hill, you know, pound the kids, you know, down. Uh, <laughs> I don't think that's how that story ended. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I will say, yes, it did. It didn't end football that way, but it sure as heck ended basketball that oh, way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Definitely so did it basketball. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I, I think in baseball, you guys got us. But, um, you know, the two biggies are football and basketball. Yeah. <laughs> so and, wrestling. 50, 50. Yeah. and wrestling. We only had like three or four kids on the team. I yeah. don't really think that counted anymore. And, and Myers wrestling mm. was always better. I mean, they, they had a real rich tradition in wrestling. But... But it's fun. I mean, it's fun even to get here, you know, it, to, to really go back and forth with, uh, you know, the ball busting about Myers and GAR. Yeah. I, I, to this day, I mean, I have friends that all we talk about is Myers, GAR. And yeah. you know what? It just brings back fond memories. And we, we all bring a smile. We're laughing. Yeah. And, and, and that's what, you know, that's what it's about. Mm. You know, that's, and that's what it could do. But at the end of the day, I would tell people just to go out there and, and, and enjoy everything you can when you can. But be there be there live in the moment and and not worry about anything else because uh, this world has a lot of distractions mm. a lot of distractions definitely and does one of the things you have to learn with football is you know you have to be focused because if you're distracted and i told you guys earlier about the reggie white experience i was a big philadelphia eagles fan and you know reggie white was my i used to wear a jersey of his in, in, in high school and I'm um, getting an opportunity to play against Reggie. It's late in the game, but I also watched him, you know, play film and watch film. And he made offensive linemen look like they weren't yeah. even there. And as I'm, I'm getting into my stance, I'm like, oh, my, I'm, I'm playing against <laughs> Reggie White. I have these starry eyes and yeah. I'm like in awe and, you know, they're glossed over. And I'm like, man, this is Reggie White. This is Reggie. And I said, Wait a second, man. You better get your head out of the clouds because yeah. if you don't really, he's going to make you look like you're not even there yeah. and throw you to the side. You better get your head out of your ass and let's go. And I realized, I said, okay, man, this is it. I mean, Reggie White or not, I got to, you know, make sure I do all my <laughs> things. And thank God I wasn't too humiliated or not. It was late in the game. And I yeah. think we were probably, uh, you know, you know we're going to lose anyway. But, um, yeah, that's what you have to do. You got to be there. <laughs> if I yeah. was a starry eyed, I thought this was a celebrity here. And yeah, I'm all right. But, Thank God, I, yeah. I, I I quickly understood. Whoa, you better you know you better focus up, buddy, because yeah. he'll make you he'll embarrass you real quick, and, and that's what has to happen. You know, get in the moment. And I would always find too in football, and and, and you know, see if you guys believe this. We'd always watch film, and it's important to watch film. You got to get tendencies and so forth. Mm-hmm. But I also knew that when I thought too much about what the other guy was going to do, it probably you know hindered me a little bit. To whereas 
if I just thought about what I was supposed to do, if mm-hmm. I thought my, about my steps and my technique, about what I was going to do, where my you know focal point was, and my you know uh, my steps and everything was going to take me, that I was a better player when I did that rather than focusing on what the other guy yeah. was going to do. And you were prepared for it. You know, you prepared yourself. You know, if you did the right technique, you could prepare for any move they made, whereas if you worried about what he was going to do, mm. you might overcompensate for the move that you think yeah. he's going to do, and next thing you know, he's doing something else, and you're, you're beat. So it, it's important to you know really have that focus to do what you do, to you know go back, fall back on your training, mm. whatever it is, and, and have enough confidence and faith that you could get the job yeah. done. It's easier to do everything when you're in that flow state, when you feel like you are mastering with what you are doing and you're not worried as much about the things around you. I definitely think it's important. You're talking about the film. It's important to know what you're up against, but I also think when you're in the situation, like when you're playing against these people, all the film watching and stuff, that doesn't necessarily matter as much in the moment as it does to just be creative and to flow and to be on top of your game. You have to focus more on what you're doing in the moment, but in preparation, I think it's, it's definitely good to know what you're up against, but in any situation where you're forced with doing with what, or doing what you're trying to do, it's just better to be focused in, in your own head. Well, the, the, our coaches, <clears throat> especially at Michigan would tell us that, you know, that we you would visualize things, you know, and, mm-hmm. you know, and you'd have to, have, you, you would play the game in your head, you know, probably before you even stepped yeah. to where you actually, when you got in the field, it became just a formality. Mm. But here's the problem with that. You know, watching film, are you visualizing you do it the right way and doing it your technique? Or yeah. you're visualizing what the other person does because you watch them on film all the time mm. and now he's going to beat you and so forth. So it, you have to visualize you doing it right. And you have to visualize yeah. you competing at what you do yeah. and visualizing your technique and how you get it done rather than what they do. Mm. And then once you do that, the actual steps and the technique of what you're doing, again, becomes second nature. That's the yeah. repetitive nature of not only doing all the reps and practice and so forth, but it starts in your head. Mm. You've got to do it in your head. And you visualize yourself, you got to visualize yourself doing it right because how many people out there have visualized them doing it wrong or visualizing getting beat? Or visualizing mm. oh, yeah. not it, happening the way you know they want it to happen, you, you put yourself in, in you know in a, in a pickle if that's the case. Yeah, that clouds your mind a lot because then you're focusing on not letting yourself or like the spectators down, rather than just focusing on like what you need to do to succeed. It's definitely way easier for shit to go wrong when you're focusing on shit going wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? It will go wrong if that's what you're going to believe. Oh yeah, absolutely. From like a worried perspective, because sometimes people get on the big stage and they you know. It's their time to shine, and they mm. they can't help but imagining what can go wrong. Oh and so, yeah, and so that's kind of might what ha- that might. It's what like nerves. It's yeah. nerves getting in the way. Well, I watch a lot of baseball, and you could tell it from a, a guy who's in a slump. You know, he'll go up there and he presses. You know, especially you know, like one guy in the Phillies. You know, specifically, he's swinging at all the first pitches. You mm. know, relax. You know, but you could tell he's pressing. He just wants to get a hit. He just yeah he wants to get up there and get it done. Where, where you think about it, I, I would say to myself, man, if I had one piece of advice to this guy, this guy's a player, he's a veteran player, he's played baseball a long yeah. time. Just go out there and, and hit the ball like you've hit it for the yeah. last 20 years. Do what you know yeah, best. Don't, don't worry about pressing. You yeah. know, the, the, see the ball, hit the ball. It becomes that simple. But mm-hmm. you know, that's just an example of we all get in our, in our own minds. Oh, absolutely. And you mm-hmm. know what? We all Listen, at the end of the day, it boils down to this. And this is why you know, f- the, you know, the focus, you, know, you can't really blame people because we're our own worst enemies. Mm. We're the ones who, you know, I could, you know, honestly, if I did it, you know, if I went back and really assessed exactly when the times, you know, that I got beat or when I wasn't right, wasn't about anybody on the other side of the ball, wasn't about anyone, you know, on my side of the ball. It was about the guy that looked back at me in the mirror. I put myself in positions because I thought the wrong way, uh, because I just wasn't prepared or I yeah. didn't do the right things. And you know what? Next thing you know, you know, you're just in a bad way, and then you're and you're pressing yourself. Mm. I, know, I mean, I in in football, I mean, you press by not knowing what's going on because you know when you don't know what's going on, you're not confident, and then you're always going to be a step behind. Mm. And if you're a step behind in the NFL, game over, you're done. These guys yeah. are too quick and too fast; they'll beat you every time. Whereas if you know what you're doing, and you're you know you're feeling confident about yourself, and you know exactly what you want to do, when you want to do it, how you want to do it, where you're going to do it, why you're going to do it, then boom, you're going to get it done. And just say, just do yeah. it. Nike's old old uh, <laughs> just slogan: do Just it. do it, baby. That's you know fun. what? Just do it.
How do you think the game has changed, like, from college to high school for you? Like, what was the difference between, like, the playing style and even the speed of the game and stuff like that? In all well, three, like high school, college, Yeah, well, the difference is, is speed of the game. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll play against a college-type player, Division One player in high school a couple times, maybe, you know, once, twice, maybe even three times. Uh, whereas, you know what, you could, uh, and plus the game itself isn't as fast mentally because you're just doing basic things. Mm-hmm. You know, some coaches, you know, they go out there and let kids, you know, really have a chance to enjoy the game and, and do some things here and there, but you're pretty basic in what you do. Every day in practice, you, you, you do these things over and over and over. There are a handful of things and so forth. So, you know what, you're not pressing physically because some of the guys just don't have you know, the speed or the quickness and stuff like that and mentally it's you should have it down pretty easy because it's not that hard so now you get up to college especially a lot of these guys now things start to even out even more but you're probably playing against a pro prospect yeah five times out of the year really mm-hmm. four or five times where you're going against a, you know a guy that's you know maybe a high round draft choice a big 10 maybe you get a little more because mm-hmm. you'll see linebackers you you know play against uh some defensive ends and tackles and, and you know as a lineman you'll face all those guys in the, in the course of a game yeah now and, and then the playbooks start to be like textbooks Mm-hmm. Playbooks are like okay, here we go, and you have to know this is a term for this, is a term yeah. for that. There's you know combination for this. You're working with this guy, you're working with that guy. This is the defense. They're in the ten different defenses. You got to know exactly where they mm-hmm. are. And so now it's like okay, you get, you get to be a little bit more of a scholar now. And if you don't know that playbook, like I said, if that delay is there, um, it's you're gonna you know be a step behind. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, you know what you might be able to overcome that with some of your athleticism, and and you know you could get away with it here and there. But you know now things start to even out. Now in the pros, everything is like okay. Now everybody's at your level. Anybody that lines up against you is going to could beat you and mm-hmm. could beat you on any play. And on top of it, not only now it's the textbook. You know, you know with. Uh, the, you know, the game, there's actually a speed to the mental game that needs to move forward because the clock keeps going. You know, I think at the time I played, the college uh, um, play clock was a lot slower. Was you know Actually, it might have been a little faster. But, you know, the, the speed of which you have to know everything and, you know, it just moves forward. Things are getting in quicker. You know, you have to move faster. you got to know exactly where you're going. So the mental of the speed, the mental – part of the game is faster and so now you have the physical part faster the mental part faster and now that means you have to be faster so if any one of the things that you do is thrown off kilt the speed of 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 the physical speed of the game will beat you and then the mental game of the speed because a lot of guys necessarily do not play football they could be the, the the best guys the fastest guys the strongest guys the biggest guys they won't play simply because the speed, the mental speed of the game, they do not understand it. Mm. They don't get it. And even like uh, you know, I would tell people, like I was, we just did a, uh, Mark Lewinsky just had a camp for the kids locally a couple of weeks ago. And uh, you know, I was teaching some of the linemen. I said, to be quick, you have to think quick. Yeah. You have to convince you because that's how it has to work. You know, the, the beautiful, you know, I mean, you could really, the symmetry of football and the poetry of football is that, you know, everything works together at once. Once you get that, you know, the mind working with the body and your spirit, man, things yeah. are going, man. I mean, that's what you're looking for. And you see it every week in the highlights. Some of these guys, what they do, uh, it just, you know, it just all comes together. And it is, it's beautiful. I mean, it, it really is poetic in many ways. It's some of these catches they make, some of these throws, the blocks, linemen getting out in the corner. And it really becomes a poetic a game it really does and even even the physicality in a sense really becomes something more poetic than anything because if you have that if you ever seen the right technique and doing it and things you know guys double teaming and so forth it's like everything's working together separate things coming together to work as one it's a beautiful thing and i think that's one of the reasons that a lot of people like football because there's a lot of that stuff there but throw one of them out if you're not keeping up with that speed First of all, you're going to be looking for a job, but there's no doubt you're going to get beat. You will definitely get beat. Yeah, I'm going to pee quick. I feel like I'm fighting this. What's the difference between, like, uh, so, like, when you're in college playing football? Yes. And then when you're in the pros playing football? College, you have a responsibility to also attend class. Yes. And also, like, like that is is another part. But, like, what's it like having this as your profession? Like, it's your job now. 
Well, how does that change? Well, in college, it was kind of our job. We, we all had, you know, uh, most of us had scholarships. So it, it was, we were actually going to college and working a full-time job. Uh, we had to have our classes done, um, you know, from eight o'clock to about two o'clock would have to be at the very latest, you had to be done with classes because by three o'clock, you got to be dressed and ready to go in meeting rooms. And then we would, you know, I would probably be there till, you know, seven, eight o'clock. I mean, we literally had two and a half hour practices, three hour practices, if not longer, all the time. Uh, so, I mean, you know, you're kind of working a full time job and going to college at the same time. But when it's your, when, when you still have to focus on school too, I mean, you got to get the grades to play. Mm -hmm. But when it's your job, it's just like any other job out there. And I told people this all the time. Anything you experience in your job, we experience in our job. The difference is there is a lot more focus and a lot more money involved mm -hmm. in our job, which probably puts a little bit more pressure on everyone because the coaches have a lot of pressure on them to succeed. If they don't win, they get fired. They, in, in return, return that pressure to us. And, you know, next thing you know, uh, if things aren't going well, it's just not a good situation for everybody. No one knows what's going to happen. People worry about their jobs all the time. Uh, but, again, it, it could very easily be related to everything anyone else experienced in their particular job about if you have unions and you have negotiations there, if you have <laughs> maybe uh, a boss you don't like, <laughs> a, a boss you don't like, <laughs> if you have <laughs> grievances, you know, grievances. <coughs> and, and listen, and this is probably what people don't think. I have a basic philosophy about everything being political. And people are like, well, what do you mean political? Everyone, when I say political, they automatically think about government. So the biggest mistake people make when it comes to politics is they think it's just about government. No, government is where politics is probably played the most. But politics is ultimately an ideal for anybody. So you're always going to follow what you believe. And the simplest definition of politics, is, it's not what you know, it's who you know. So it's always about relationships, mm -hmm. okay. you know, and if you have a good relationship with a guy, it could keep you on the team. If you have a bad relationship mm -hmm. with somebody, it could get you off the team. You know, everyone thinks that the NFL is always about winning. It's not. Most of these owners want one thing. They want money. There's teams that want to win and they make moves to put, you know, they, the political move that they make is to, you know, put, you know, people in the stands by, you know, signing somebody yeah. that's big name or <clears> by <throat> getting something that's attractive to people right. to do this, mm -hmm. but they don't necessarily put together a team that's a winning team. Mm -hmm. You can't tell me that for years some of these teams actually tried to give you a winning product. No, they tried to sell you on the fact that they're giving yeah. you a winning product, but they're not really giving you a winning pot product. I've seen guys signed with certain teams that the general manager had relationships with, you know, agents who would sign, you know, those that agent's players, and he would get chance, you know, more chances than others because of relationships, mm. and these relationships basically, you know, fuel the game. Unfortunately, it it kind of doesn't always put the best teams out there and the mm. best guys on the field at the time because you know a lot of these relationships, people, coaches, players will follow certain coaches, uh, coaches will fall and players will follow certain general yeah. managers, and I'll, I'll tell you exactly what happened to me when I got cut by the Carolina Panthers. There was some, uh, I guess there was an issue in the front office, and it all started with Kevin Green in training camp. And Kevin Green, the year before, we had gone to the NFC Championship game and we lost to the Green Bay Packers led by Brett Favre, Reggie White, you know, was on that team yeah. as well. And they would end up beating us in Lambeau Field, the Flores and Tundra at Tundra, and it was freezing that day. Wow. And they would go on to win the Super Bowl. It was the only oh. Super Bowl win in, in Brett Favre's mm -hmm. career. So we're feeling good about ourselves because I think the trend was that the team that lost the NFC Championship the previous year was in a good position to win the mm -hmm. Super Bowl the next year. And we had no reason to believe that we wouldn't be competitive. Unfortunately, there was an incident with our quarterback in training camp, but also Kevin Green did not you know, want, you know, want to come to camp. He wanted to actually renegotiate his contract because he signed a couple-year deal. He had a great year the year before, and he wanted um, ultimately to get more money. Yeah. But I think he also wanted to take camp off, you know, and, and that's, you know, camp, you know, could beat you up. I mean, it was a physical game back then and mm. so forth. But he did sign a two-year deal. But anyway, unfortunately, um, as time went on, he stayed out longer and longer and longer and longer to the point where he wanted to come back, but he wanted our, our general manager, Bill Pullian at the time, to forgive all the fines that he had accumulated during his no-show during yeah. training camp. Bill Pullian said no. Mm. 
Mm. So it ends up Kevin Green gets cut, ends up going with San Francisco. We have all kinds of problems with, um, you know, with the team. We only end up eight and eight that year. Yeah. And unfortunately, we took for granted that, you know, the trend was that the team went, uh, the team that lost the year before in the ch- uh, championship game mm. went to the Super Bowl. Unfortunately, Things happened and it got crazy. Yeah. Fast forward to the next year, which is you know my going to be my third year in the league, which you know I'm starting to make some really good money. Everything's great. Well, I'm a Bill Polian guy. I was brought in by Bill Polian, and unfortunately now Bill Polian, I guess, has so some issues with one of the Richardson son, and he would now become a very integral part in signing people. Polian goes to Indianapolis. And uh, they bring back Kevin Green to resign. But what you don't notice is you kind of see that they're starting to get rid of Pullian's guys. Yeah. They're starting to cut out that influence. Unfortunately, I was one of those guys. Mm. And it was, I remember Dom Capers was our head coach. And, you know, my agent called me. And it, it, was, it came on, like on the eve of camp. It was like a couple weeks before camp was going to start. Um, they told me to kind of stay away and here I think, you know, my time has come and I'm going to, yeah. you know, I've, I've earned the right finally to, you know, what, to, you know, uh, be a veteran and get some of fringe benefits like this and so forth. And uh, so what happens was out of the blue, I get cut mm. and Capers wants to talk to me. And I said to my agent, I said, I don't want to talk to him. Yeah. I, I don't feel like I should talk to him. I, I'm, I'm just not, you know, I don't want to say something I, I'm mm. going to regret. I'm very emotional at the time. I'm I'm I scheduled to make really good money. Um, financially, I had it all planned out. Everything was going to yeah. you know, do this. And um, it just, you know, I get cut. And, and it was so late in the season that all the money was kind of taken. And all I could do was get, get uh, you know, minimum money for the player that I was, the veteran player that I was, which was good money, but was nowhere near. It was four or five times less than I, what wow. I was going to do to make. And that's all I saw was that difference. So it put me in a bad way. And Dom Capers, I said, so why did they just renegotiate with mm. me? I would have probably renegotiated if they wanted me to. Well, he said, well, I don't, we don't feel like he's, he's a st- we feel like he's a starting player and, and stuff. We don't think yeah. he should renegotiate, which probably is a line of crap. But anyway, point being, it was a political move. Yeah, It wasn't a football move because the guy that re- replaced me, I think, got cut before the season was over. Wow. And so people, I said, everything's po- politics. It's about relationships. And that's what you have to, you know, understand that it's nothing wrong with, you know what, knowing people and doing stuff for people. But you have to understand that sometimes it works for you. Yeah. Sometimes it works against you. And in this instance, it works against me. Now, Polian would try to sign me uh, with the Colts. I kind of just said, I was so disappointed and upset. I just looked like I said I, f- I focused on what I wasn't yeah. going to make. And it kind of, I sat out that year, probably the worst thing I could have done for myself and never really got back into the game, all based on, you know, a, a political difference yeah. in the front office between Bill Polian and, and uh, I believe it was Mark yeah. Richardson was the one son's name. And, and it all happened over instance yeah. that I didn't do now. I mean, I lived up to my contract. Yeah. I did what they told me to do, and unfortunately that's the way it is. And that's how it works in the NFL. Did you realize that prior to coming into the NFL that it was a big business, or did you realize that kind of around that same time when all this was going on with you? Well, you you learn quickly it's a business. Yeah. I mean, college football is a business too, but none of the players see any money, mm. and we're all basically in it together. You know, you get a scholarship. Yeah. Hey, we got scholarships, and, and I felt really a, a great sense of uh, of admiration for our walk-ons mm. because they were getting you know doing the same things we were for for just being on the team and, yeah. and they didn't get any money for a scholarship we were getting scholarships so we we're getting a free education which was great but you don't you know you don't get that individual money that separates guys so you know we're a pretty close group so we don't really see the business side of it I and mean, we know it's around us we know yeah. what kind of money they're making but we're not making any mm. so it changes it but once you get in the game and you see what kind of money's out there and how things happen. You learn quickly about you know, your, your union, you know, the union fights. You, you learn about trading cards. You learn about you know, uh, your, your uh, sneaker deals and, yeah. and, and all this stuff that comes off. You learn about off-field. You learn about endorsements. Then you, mm. you, know, you learn about your contract. Heck, the very first game I played in was the week one. Where I think we, you know, we were on the road against Cincinnati. They came up to me and said, oh, you're inactive. I said, well, what do you mean? What does inactive mean? Inactive means you don't dress for the game. Mm. I had no clue what that was. I mean, now I know I, yeah. I was inactive. I guess a couple guys, you, you only allowed to dress so many people 
for a game, and I think five guys were inactive, you know, from the normal roster. I happened to be one of those guys. Well, to tell you about the speed of the game, the next week was at home. We're playing the Cleveland Browns, and you know, I was activated. I was dressed, and within you know the first couple series, I'm in the game because the right guard went down real yeah. quick, and then unfortunately, unfortunately, he went back in, and I came out. But yeah, that's how quick the turnaround is. Mm. And uh, one week, you know what, you're not dressing. The next week, you know, you're in real yeah. quick on the second, third series of the game because the right guard went down, mm. you know, and he had to go in and fill in, in for him. And then there's another thing you learn as an offensive lineman. You have to play every position. Oh, yeah. You have to play, you know, you pretty much know the guard positions, the tackle positions. Center's a little bit more uh, of a different position. Yeah. But most most guys would probably end up knowing the, the center position too. And you would probably even know a little bit of the tight end position because, you know, usually combination block yeah. with them a lot. You wouldn't know the routes because we never <laughs> we never got a chance to If only to we route. got to know them. Well, right? I, I wish. I, you know, I mean, <laughs> some of those guys get to, you know, get to, get the dream, you know, oh, and yeah. get the you know, offensive line and get the touchdown, which is good to see. So I, I feel like I, I vicariously lived through those mm. offensive linemen that, you know, that got to catch it. So, but um, yeah, it, it just really quick, really happens, and the next thing you know, I mean, your career's over. Yeah. Did you ever like playing like the defense side of ball? Uh, in high school, when I was being you know recruited, I could have um, I could have you know played defense, but it just thinks you know, I just thought everything was geared to me being a good offensive yeah. player. In fact, um, I actually started. Believe it or not, I think this is crazy when I think about it. I was 13 years old when I started on the varsity team at GAR. That's insane. 13 years old. Is that even allowed? Probably <laughs> not today. Yeah, probably not 13 today. 13 years what old. Like seventh grade at 13? Seventh grade. Oh, no, ninth grade. Ninth grade. And I started school a year early, so that's kind of why mm. I was. Now, I wouldn't turn 14 until January of the next year. So I was a solid 13-year-old. And the, where I started on, you know, and, and defense, I started defensively. Mm. And one of the reasons I started defensively is I could read a defense pretty good, meaning wherever the blocking scheme was and what they were doing, I could read it really yeah. good. And um, But I was a 13-year-old kid. I didn't mm. know what the hell I was doing. I was 13 years old. I think about it now and say, man, I mean, I was just going through puberty yeah. <laughs> for crying out loud. But everyone would look at my mm. size and think otherwise. But mentally, I was like, I was 13 yeah. years old. I was there's like literally some people playing in the in Williamsport in the Little mm. League World Series at you know Little League age 13 or age 12 because they're 13 and I'm I'm playing varsity yeah. football. I'm like, wow. Yeah, it's a crazy feeling. Well, one the reason I asked is because I played both sides of the ball in high school as well, but I was mainly an offensive player as well. And uh, one thing I always enjoyed about playing defense was that it almost seemed easier to play defense because of how knowledgeable I was on the offensive side of the ball. You bring up a valid point and a great point, and I don't think a point that most players realize when they're playing. Yeah. Uh, you, most of us, especially if you go to high, smaller high schools like we did, you're going to have to go both mm. ways. You, you just don't have the athletes, to, you know, to cover it. I mean, every, yeah. no one wants to be a lineman. You know, so everybody wants to be a skilled guy, wants to throw the ball, wants to run the ball, wants to catch the ball. Anyway, most of us play both ways. If you want to be a good offensive lineman, I would tell you the first one of the first things you have to do is study how defensive linemen play. Yeah. And it, you know what, because what will happen is you will see exactly what they're taught to do, what they mm. do, what their you know, alignments are and so forth, which is going to make your game easier. Yeah. Because if you know where a guy is going to go before he goes mm. it, now you have the, uh, you know, the advantage of knowing where the ball and the play is going. You have the advantage of the snap count. And then if you will put on top of that, understanding defensive alignments mm. and how they do it. And if you did watch a little game film, understanding those tendencies, you literally could step into a block. Yeah. And so, but then consequently, I'd also tell you if you play defensive line, study the offensive line. Mm. Because they'll tell you a lot too. Absolutely. So it's it's one of those things, and then and I guess you could do the you know you could go uh, down the line of scrimmage and say the same thing with receivers and defensive backs and 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 you know tight ends and linebackers and running backs and and, and so forth. Uh, quarterbacks pretty much have to know everything. Yeah. But yeah, study your opponent not only uh, by what he does, but you know what he's supposed to do, what what they teach him to do, and your life becomes easy mm. or do you, easier. Do you have any uh, like for lack of a better term? Um, Shit. Uh, in making it to that NFC Championship game and losing it, did was there a uh, like an, a, a sour emotion in coming up that close to the Super Bowl and not ever being able to play it inside of a Super Bowl? Well, I mean, you get paid. Um, 
you know, for going so far in the playoffs and you get to certain checks and stuff yeah. like that. But bottom line is everyone plays the game for the ring. Mm. That's all you played. You play to go to the Super Bowl. You play to win the Super Bowl. Yeah. And to think that Tom Brady has won Super Bowls and I've never been to one, <laughs> it's like, yeah. come on. That um, guy's wild. And, and you know what? But you look at a lot of great players have never made it to the Super Bowl. Mm. And a lot of players, you know, haven't had that chance. And it's all that I played for. I mean, yeah. I really wanted that ring and, and to play in the Super Bowl. And to think that we were this close from getting there and all, and didn't happen. Yeah. It, it, it plays on you. It definitely plays on you. You know, I, I would look back at it and, and understand that I had a wonderful experience. Mm. But there's an emptiness that comes up when I, you know, I think about it because yeah. we were just so close. Because in the game, we actually had a lead in that game. And it was so cold. I mean, it, it, the, the stadium lived up to its name, the Frozen Tundra of Lambeau Field. Yeah. Uh, it was so cold um, that, I mean, I wore short sleeves because that's an offensive lineman's uh, credo. You have to do it. <laughs> you know, that's what, you know, what – you know, makes you a big boy. And I made a mistake of when I went in at halftime, not changing my undershirt because you still sweat. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm telling you, when I came out in the third quarter, that shirt was literally frozen to yeah. me. And I'm like, oh, you dumbass. But the good news was there was some heaters on the, on the sidelines so you could get in there and loosen up a little bit. And once you're on the field and you're playing, it's a different game. Yeah. So you could get, you know, used to it. But I do believe that, that you know, that cold had an uh, Ill, Ill effect on our – skilled people and it really tightened us up and unfortunately we just didn't I don't know if we could have won anyway Green Bay was loaded with talent but I think we could have probably ended up giving yeah. them a better game but we we were winning that game and it was a mm. one thing to be especially when you go up in that NFC championship game you're at Lambeau Field yeah. and it's like wow man this is awesome and I remember being overcome with emotions when we scored that touchdown I even got a picture in the newspaper where I'm spiking the ball oh, I got the dope, ball <laughs> yes it was it was nuts it was crazy what do you I, think about the uh, the current state of the NFL today? Like, do you still enjoy watching it? I, oh, I love it. You know, but it's not the same game. Uh, we talked about many reasons, but one of the reasons, one of the the reasons that it's it's kind of taken a little bit. Um, it probably is probably taken and went backwards a little bit because guys don't practice as long as they used to anymore. Mm. So that means they they don't spend a lot of time on technique. They mm. don't spend a lot of time on you know, seeing things and, and they'll spend a lot of time on, on getting things done that way. And it, it does have an impact yeah. on the game. Now, the good news is they're so athletic and, and, and so prepared for stuff like that, um, that, you know, they, some of them can, um, can, you know, they can overcome their mistakes mm. because of it. But you see some of the sloppiness. You just don't see the push like you used to on an offensive yeah. line coming off because they don't emphasize the the run. You know, they, they, they're passing school. But you do see some great, you know, pass blocking. You still some see some great quarterbacking in the receivers and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, from the technical standpoint, yeah, it's a little worse. But you know what? It's still football. I still love it. I still root for the teams I root for. I, I mean – it still brings you know our family together, and we enjoy it. And yeah. I mean, it's it's like I said, you you have a little bit love or hate here because you feel I'm I could feel the pains every day of my life. But like I told you before, I mean, there's it's done so much for me that uh, yeah, I still love watching it. What's the dynamic in in like enjoying all of, all of those different teams? Like you said, at heart, you're a Philadelphia Eagles fan, but then you also played for the Raiders and the Panthers. Like, do you find well, it hard like when well, they play each other, who to go for? No, well. You know, understand that, you know, there's always been a, uh, you know, a little issue with me and the Carolina Panthers because I was yeah. cut by them. Uh, the Raiders, I love, and I root for the Raiders. And, um, you know, I really believe they were a great family organization, mm. which, you know, people was like, Raiders family? I don't get it. They're the, you know, the bad boy kind of yeah. group and stuff. No, you know, the Raiders were really family orientated al davis and his family took you know just treated us as one of the family mm -hmm. if he believed you were loyal to him he would be yeah. loyal to you and he was to a lot of people though if it crossed them i i wouldn't want to do that you know with them but he was very good to me he took care of my me and my family he you know in one particular situation he paid for you know me and my family and my kids to come up yeah. and put us in a great situation so i never have a bad word about mr davis and 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 mark i think he's a pretty good guy um so i, I think you know they're heading in a pretty good direction i hope they win but they haven't really been successful lately caroline i'm you know i'm a little still i guess you could say bitter yeah uh, it's i don't still don't understand exactly what happened totally i mean i was having the two best years of my mm. career in carolina and then it was cut short 
And then like a dumbass, I sat out and, you know, ended my career. But I, I, I don't have any regrets in that terms because physically maybe my body was starting to, you know, deteriorate. And so maybe yeah. it was a good thing that I didn't, you know, last too much longer. Uh, so, but I mean, I love the Eagles. Mm. Eagles were my child. I don't think you could stray far from your childhood team. I really yeah. don't. I just, I grew up an Eagle guy. I remember Bill Berge was one of my favorite players growing up, and then Jaworski and, and, and mm. Harold Carmichael was a big 6'7 receiver, and Wilbert Montgomery, and you know Jerry Sizemore, and a couple other guys, uh, Frank Lamaster on defense, John Bunning, you know, uh, you know, it's it just one of those things. I mean, I remember the, the uniforms are still my one of my favorite yeah. uniforms. Uh Herm Edwards and the, you know what happened with the Giants, you know <laughs> when they should have just kneeled on the ball and he, you know they fumbled and he got the, you know, yeah. the touchdown in the end zone late in the game. It's it's just something about being a kid. Even like the Phillies, I mean you know, when they won the 1980 World Series, I mean a baseball guy. Greg Luzinski was my favorite player, big guy. Of course, he shared the same mm. first name, which meant a lot. And then you know what the Flyers in the 70s. I mean I love Dr. J. Yeah. I always thought Dr. J got kind of a bad rap i always felt he was as good as michael jordan in many senses other than he just didn't have that jump shot he didn't have that outside mm. jump but he spent a lot of his career in the uh, in the aba which you know kind of makes you wonder what he could have done in the nba if he was there full time so uh, but yeah i don't get it i mean childhood things even i go down to clearwater florida to see the phillies games um you know their preseason games mm. and they have a lot of old memorabilia there yeah and i find myself buying a lot of this old memorabilia because mm. it brings back such fond memories because you get to get it for really cheap but it means something to me yeah. you know it, it really you know a lot of the stuff you see in my house you'll see just you know it brings it, it, it it's stimulus to bring back you know pot, positive vibes yeah. and to keep me grounded in many ways I mean you'll see you see a lot of the Hulk, you know, guys here and, and oh, one of the things yeah. the Hulk is is funny because I, I you know there's you know yeah, there's a lot of talk about CTE and stuff, and there's anger issues, you know, associated with it. And you know, I just kind of have to remind myself that you don't want to get to that point to where you, you turn into something you don't want to yeah. be. And mm. um, so it's it's and plus we love Marvel comics and stuff. But when you know, when you're a kid, man, I just don't see how you stray too far yeah. from your childhood love. It's bliss, man. You don't ever get those times back. Like, I, I don't think, well, back to my question, like what I was asking you before about which team you'd prefer to root for, that's something I've always been curious to know the answer to. Like, whether or not uh, in playing for another team in the NFL, if you would, say, lose a little bit of love for your team or, I don't know, whether or not it would be harder for you to like a new team than your old former team or if you would like your childhood team more. But definitely, like you're saying, I think just things from your childhood – there are things that will always leave a lasting imprint on you and your whole life. And uh, it's very hard to let go of a lot of those things. So I think like it, it definitely makes a lot of sense as to why you would never lose that love for that initial childhood team. Cause that's also probably a big part of what got you into football to begin with. Just watching these people when you were younger. Well, sure. And when you meet guys like that and you and you find yourself, the older you get, you usually meet the guys mm -hmm. that you looked up to when you were a kid. And it's, it's like, you know, you're a kid all over again. Yeah. Now, I, I have that same feeling for the University of Michigan. I mean, I love Michigan, and anyone who knows me knows knows that, that, uh, you know, usually see me in a Michigan hat or some kind of Michigan garb. I, I put the Raiders hat on now because yeah. it's a pretty new hat, and, you know, the, the kids like that. <laughs> so I just put it on. Uh, but, uh, and, you know, we're supposed to go at the end of the month of Vegas to uh, do an alumni thing mm -hmm. there for one of the preseason games. Hopefully that's still on. But, um, yeah, it's, it's it just when you could – if you, as you older, you know, it's funny, the older you get, I don't feel any different in yeah. terms of, you know, how I feel about my teams or I still feel like I'm a kid in many ways, but mm. you just get a little, you know, more aches and pains and stuff like that. But uh, I think, you know, you want to have those, uh, those childlike, um, experiences where you lived. It's oh, good yeah. to be, you know, you, you got to have that, you know, you know, that love a heart, you know, a mm. child. You, you know, we're told, you know, in, in our faith to have the love like a child mm. because it's so open and it's so unconditional. Yeah. And that's what it was. I was an unconditional fan. Mm. You're an unconditional fan. And whatever the Eagles did, I still loved Just them. loved it. Yeah. I mean, we, I had my, listen, when you're a Philadelphia fan and you're a diehard Philadelphia fan, you will die hard. Gets rough. I mean, the Phillies have only won two <laughs> championships in like 150 years of baseball. I mean, wow. the, you know, we've only won one world, you know, Super Bowl champ. You know, the the Flyers haven't won anything since the '70s, and I think the Sixers the same thing. And since '83, yeah. um, wow. Uh, although they've been to a couple here and there, but so we, you know, we're used to dying hard. But man, 
I, they brought a lot of joy to my heart, you know, even just watching them going to the games. And I'm in a position now that I could go and afford a lot. Yeah. My dad took me to one Phillies game when uh, I was a kid. It was a twilight doubleheader, and uh, I was in awe. I was in awe. It was just the greatest thing since sliced bread. And then my buddy ended up my senior year, I think. Uh, actually, might have been, you know, might have been my junior year. He took me to a preseason Eagles game. And, again, it was wow. at Veteran Stadium, which – those old, you know, those old municipal stadiums, they're, <laughs> they're, they're tough. I mean, yeah. not, they, you know, the turf was hard, but to me mm -hmm. it was like, you know, this is this is the, the castle that we talked about earlier yeah. in the show. Yeah, this is it, man. I love it. Yeah, wow. Uh, I'm, I'm loving And we were in the you know, nosebleed mm -hmm. seats. It's like, oh, this is great. But that's the one thing, too, that no matter even – I did make professional um, – uh, football and I and I played on the highest levels I never stopped being a fan yeah never and if you stop being a fan I think you know you're doing yourself an injustice you even enjoyed watching the game of football while you were playing like actively oh absolutely absolutely I mean uh, even not to the point I was always a collector uh, if you go into one of my you know the things I have um, a lot of the autographs of the some of the players the big players I played with the Raiders still yeah. there and, like, it's amazing uh, the who's who that I played with, uh, you know, Howie Long, Greg Townsend, Ronnie Lott, Marcus Allen, Eric Dickerson. It's crazy. You know, Vince Evans was old, at, you know, when I played, but Vince Evans, I, I watched as a kid. Yeah. And he was with Chicago. And, you know, these guys, it's it just amazing. Um, Tim Brown, uh, Steve Wisniewski is a good friend yeah. of mine. Still, he played there. He, he was, like, one of the last of the one-team players. Mm -hmm. You don't see that anymore. I mean, this guy spent his whole career – um, in you know, in with the Raiders, you know, probably should be in the Hall of Fame. Wondering why he wasn't is not in the Hall of yeah. Fame. He was like an eight year Pro Bowl player. He, he's, a, he's a gentleman, he's, he's a great influence on all of us. He's a good Christian man, and, and the man should be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, but you know, these are this is what I played with, yeah. and um, Carolina was a little new, you know, so we, you know, was it wasn't we really weren't made of uh, a lot of names and stuff, but we, yeah. you know, what we all came together for the greater good. and we made something of it, and that run that we had um, and only in the second year of Carolina's existence was phenomenal. And, in fact, you know, Jacksonville does the same thing. You know, Jacksonville did the same thing, and, you know, maybe it would have been pretty cool if we played Jacksonville in the Super Bowl because it would have been too – Both of those teams were implemented second. at the same time. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. we were, you know, we were um, two years old at the time, both wow. of both franchises. So it would have been real cool, but – I think it ended up being what um, Green Bay won. Who did they play? Was it was it New England or not? One hundred percent sure who beat Jacksonville that you know that year. I I do know we lost yeah. to Green Bay. So. Wow. What do you think is one person that you've met along your career that like really you you felt like a kid around? Like what's one person that you met that you were in <laughs> awe? Uh, is there one that fanboy moment? Or how about like a couple guys that you've met that you didn't even didn't even feel real? Oh, well, didn't feel real. <laughs> There's some experiences, but when you're in LA, man, you, you get to meet a lot of oh, different yeah, people. Oh, sure. right? yeah, it's, right. it's not just, um, not just, you know, athletes, but, you know, a everyone. I mean, it's just amazing. And the one guy just passed away, uh, you know, from, uh, you know, you know, the godfather, uh, Sonny, what's his name? <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, uh, it's not Pesci, is it? No, 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 no. It's uh, I, the name escaped me, but um, he he actually was in a place that I had met him. And he, it was I was like he was in the program in the movie James Con, and uh, he was in the movie the program as the head coach, okay. and I liked the program then. But he was you know in a lot of different movies, and uh, I met him, and it was funny because he started coaching me up, and I'm like, "Are you kidding me?" I said, "You're a big actor and all this other stuff," and I find out he was a Michigan State guy. So it was a rival, but it was fun. And, you know, we ended up having a pretty good relationship, you know, uh, in terms of when I seen him here and there. So that mm -hmm. was pretty cool. I mean, this is a guy from, you know, the, one of the biggest films ever, The Godfather. And yeah. like I said, I love the program. We met, um, you know, Shaq. I met Shaq. And oh, that was, wow. that's definitely an awe. He, he looked at me. He was getting in the elevator. He goes, hey, big man, how you doing? I said, hey, I'm pretty good. And <laughs> nobody, you know, nobody, nobody really dwarfs me. Now, from a physical standpoint, I probably was wider than he was at the time. But he's a big man. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that's probably that. That's probably one of the first guys you've met that. Yeah. Well, yeah oh, yeah. Well, right. he was in there, like, and I think he was actually in the elevator with Kobe. But he was. This is when Alameda, when they were. I guess they were coming to play Golden State. The, when I was staying and you know, working out mm -hmm. for the Raiders the last time, you know, I was staying in the Alameda 
hotel there, um, you know, preparing for the in the off season, preparing for the season. But yeah, you scrunched up in the elevator, hey, big man. I said, oh, <laughs> I'll just wait now. You know, I'll wait oh, my turn. Yeah. It, it was pretty cool. And he's, like, he, you know, I love Shaq because he's a he's a cool guy. I mean, he's just a real neat guy. Yeah. Um, I met uh, you know a couple you know, musicians you meet along along the way. Um, what's his name? Uh, <laughs> you know what? Of course, my memory doesn't serve me great right now. Um, I had a moment with uh, you know a days a days of our life star her name was Hope uh, and she's I think still on the show and it was funny our our paths crossed and you know we smiled at each other and I'm thinking oh boy this is yeah. pretty cool the only problem is my wife was right there <laughs> 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 but it, it was fun you know what I went to the Beverly Center lot oh you know who the guy I met that was I mean I was in complete awe it was actually at that same place the Beverly Center which I used to go in all the time especially in the off season but. They used to have a store there made of a memorabilia, but historical memorabilia, not just sport memorabilia, where for future you know, presidents, you know, big names in histories would have like cash, you know, um, checks and, 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 and stuff like that, you know, letters and stuff they'd signed, mm -hmm. you know, throughout history. It's pretty cool. But in the one bookstore on the third floor, they had a signing that particular day, and I was there super early, and coming in was uh, Muhammad Ali. Whoa. Oh my yeah, Muhammad God. Ali was coming in and he was with his one photographer and they just had come up with a book and, and there was nobody in line. Yet. Oh my God. So I said, Hey, I'm going to go up and see Muhammad Ali. And then what was I, that like? Oh, it was, it, it was pretty cool. Um, you know, of course he had his Parkinson's and he, he couldn't really speak that much, but he was standing up. And when I walked in there, he gave me like a little fish shake and stuff. And I said, ah, champ, you'll still beat me. No, no worries there. And uh, unfortunately, I mean, he was shaken bad from his Parkinson's. But oh, and then he, his hand got on the book, and you know, he's, he's it stopped shaking, and he signed the autograph. And then the photographer signed the autograph, and I, I just looked at him, and he was a he's a pretty big guy. Yeah. And I was in awe. I mean, I know what he's done for sport. I know, yeah. you know what kind of boxer he was, but just the kind of guy he was, and what he's done for mm. the entire man. I mean, there's probably other than Michael Jordan now, there was probably not a more recognizable name in sport. Than Muhammad Ali's name, and, and it was so cool. I mean, yeah, I, I would have loved to have a conversation with oh him, my but God. unfortunately, like I said, he couldn't really talk, but we had a little, you know, fun mm. moment together, and I'd still have the book and his autograph and stuff. And really? Like here? Uh, yeah, it's in. It's oh, I got to see that. Wow. <laughs> it's I up love there. Muhammad I'm, I'm yeah. pretty sure it's uh, on the bookshelf. Oh, my God. But, uh, in fact, me and my, my brother-in-law were talking about going to visit, I think, you know, where he trained up yeah, in the Poconos. Yeah, Deer Park, I yeah, think Yeah, I think we're going up to see it, just to, you know, yeah, go up and want to see it. Yeah, he's, he's a, you know, it was, he, you know, there's guys there that you meet that, you know, transformed the game. Mm -hmm. and he, he went above that and yeah. transformed, you know, that, you know, he, he took his celebrity and, and did it for a good thing. Plus, you know, it was fun, you know, to watch him as a, as a, entertainer because he truly was not only an athlete he really entertained mm. you and you know what but he always put his money where his mouth was yeah and probably probably mm -hmm. too too many times because he ended up getting the parkinson's but yeah that was pretty cool Muhammad Ali that's was insane cool. yeah that's yeah. mind-blowing oh, man i don't know that's one of the coolest things about doing this this whole venture that we're on right now though is like connecting with some of the people that like i've, I've always wished to work with like for example that yes three group we were just telling you about earlier like i actually had reached out to them recently and we got connected and we're talking and it's, it's just mind blowing stuff. Like these are people you almost like held them to a, uh, like a way more powerful or like godly level sure. Kinda, uh, sure. that you would never even picture like running into or meeting or talking to these people. But in hopefully at some point when this is way bigger than us and it's way bigger than it is now, like I'll have the opportunity to talk to all these people I ever oh, wished of talking will. to. You definitely and will. That's one of the coolest, like, uh, like mind F's, I guess you could say is, uh, just thinking about, like, at one point, like, it, it almost felt like me and these people didn't live in the same world, and now, <laughs> like, they're right there. Like, they're right in reach. These people I've always wanted to, like, pick their brain and learn from, it's right there. So that's one of the coolest things about this whole venture, just talking to dope people that I've looked up to for a very long time. What you find out, you know, no matter who you meet, you know, they're just people. Yeah. And you know mm -hmm. what? Most of them are down to earth. Yeah, you have your, you know, a couple percent that are goofs. But most of them are, are down earth people, and you realize that hey, they're no different than you know, than you or me. Yeah, and you know what? There's no reason that you can't have that kind of life if that's so you so true. You mm. can't be around that. I mean, there was times, and I never really got a chance to talk to them, but 
met Wayne Gretzky. You know, Wayne wow. Gretzky was fun. It was fun because he was, we actually went into the box of the LA Kings, you know, mm. um, back when I played. Steve Wright got his tickets up there. And this is when you know, Rocket Ismail, Myers guy, yeah. was playing in, in Toronto. And I sat right next to, you know, Wayne. And in fact, in fact, the program's right over there that he signed for me. Um, and uh, I said, you know, I said, how's Rocket yeah. doing and stuff? We had a nice conversation about Rocket. Real nice uh, guy. I mean, the greatest hockey player ever to play the game. I mean, it was just nice. Nice guy. Had uh, nothing bad to say. Mm. And, and it was just a, a normal conversation. Magic Johnson and, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was always at our games. Yeah. Um, you, know, uh, you know, James Gardner um, was a guy that, you know, I met through there. Um, the, uh, what, what was, what guy, a musician I met in, uh, at the locker room in Carolina, was the devil went down to Georgia. I mean, he's saying oh. that. Devil uh, went down to Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I forget. I'm the wrong person. Yeah, to ask. again, I'm, I'm drawing blanks right now. But uh, yeah, Charlie man. Daniels, Charlie Daniels. Oh, I mean, he, yeah. and you know what I'm thinking? I'm, boy, I love that song. And it's yeah. like, you know what? Just a normal, down to earth guy. That yeah. you're like, wow. Um, and you, you know what? There's probably <clears> more guys that I forgot that I met because it, it, it just, you know, it's great. I mean, I grew up. Growing, you know, I loved Bill Frelick. Bill Frelick played with the, the Pittsburgh, you know, um, Panthers. He would go on to play in the pros. I think Atlanta, mm. a couple other teams. But when I was a kid and 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 met him after a Temple game, and I, you know, and my sister went to Temple, and I was being recruited by Temple. But to me, that was you know put me on cloud nine. You know, meeting Bill Frelick because I think you know, he's one of the best all time yeah. you know, players in college football, and it was so cool to watch him and then meet him and I think I still have the hat that he autographed for me back then um met Ron Jaworski he actually came here Jaworski was I think at one of the Unico Unico team captains they used to bring in like big celebrities for the Unico team captains and you know of course being an Eagle fan Ron Jaworski was uh you know a big you know name for me heck I was my first autograph it was actually a Cole Street Park. It was right across from my house. And then, believe it or not, it was the Philly Fanatic. Oh, <laughs> the Philly Fanatic has always been my favorite. And you know what? Probably, I think it was probably the original Philly Fanatic. And, you know, who knows? He signed it. I was, But I was thrilled as a kid, you know, to get the Philly Fanatic. Yeah. To, you know, I, it, pictures weren't as readily easy then, you know. So, you, you, had, you know, no one really had a great camera, you know, like your phone. I mean, yeah. you could get a picture anywhere. But it's, you know, it, I met Greg Luzinski. I would meet him later on. And, um, you yeah, know, he was like it, it for me. Luzinski was like, you know, I wore number 19 in the Little League because yeah. of Luzinski and stuff. So, yeah, you meet these guys, but you really quickly realize that, hey, they're nice people. Mm. They're, you know, they're people that, you know, uh, you know, live, eat, and breathe like you do. Most of them don't think they're anything special. You yeah. know what? They, they've, they've lived, you know, recognizable lives and, and full lives and, and, and so forth. And unfortunately, you know, f- fortunately for them, they lived in an, you know, an industry that mm-hmm. paid well and, you know, brought them a, a great opportunity. But I don't, I think that opportunity is available to everybody. Oh, yeah. Do. If you go out and search for that opportunity, I think it's available to everybody. And, and you will get to experience, you know, a lot of the things that I've experienced in the game. Like I said, it's all because of football, and it's really yeah. cool to think that. And I think, you know, this podcast will will, will take you guys places you, you never thought. Oh you'd yeah, go. And, and hopefully you continue to do it and enjoy it, and then open up your opportunities for yourselves. It already has, man. Like the the amount of connections and like dope people we get to talk to every single week, and like the the creativity and consistency and passion it brings out of us as well. Like it's it's. You, you would never think that just sitting down and talking to people would be, I guess, so driving in a way or so yeah. polarizing or so, I don't even know what the proper word would be is. But yeah, uh, yeah man, I, I would have never thought it, just from the, the idea of, of loving to have conversation and just fun times and cracking jokes, shits and giggles with your friends would lead to something this cool. And I, I don't know, man, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. I can't wait to see what the future holds, though, because... Every single week we've leveled up tenfold, tenfold, tenfold. We're just getting so much better every week. And it's just, it's something new that we get to, like, since football is no longer there for us anymore, like it used to be, that's what uh, caught me. The Like, initially, that's what I poured everything into. Yep. To have something new and to be able to take a completely different route in life. I mean, it's exciting, man. It really is. It's amazing. Yeah. Another guy that I would have to say that was pretty cool meeting, and, and I wasn't, necessarily a fan of his before but you know i became a big nascar fan jimmy spencer and i were you know we became real close he was uh, out of berwick and he was on the you know circuit then and 
you know, I, I was a big Jeff Gordon fan, and, you know, I met Jeff, but I also knew his crew chief really well, Ray Evernham, that I used to go take people up to the yeah. office and stuff. And Jimmy used to, you know, take me all over. And, and to the point where I, I, Junior Johnson was a big NASCAR guy. He went to his house before a race, I think, in North Wilkesboro. Richard Petty, mm-hmm. you know, we went to his, you know, went to talk to him and went to his shop, and we had a great conversation, big football fans. But the one guy I met was Dale Earnhardt. Oh wow, Dale yeah. Earnhardt, not not the son, but the, yeah. the, the original Dale Earnhardt. That wow. you just don't realize how big this guy is in the NASCAR world. So you know, we were in the in their trailer. You know, the, the, there's a little spot in their in their trailers that are is for casual you walk and you're sitting down and relaxing and stuff. And Jimmy took me back there, which you know, <laughs> not everyone's going to get back there. First of all, I mean, I'm in in some pretty you know a pretty esteemed place there you know and anybody yeah. at that race would have loved it but i sat down with dale earnhardt which you know uh, outside of him and richard petty i mean they're only two you know right there i mean side to side and, and this guy you know, he would just look exhausted a bigger guy but old school kind of guy and he was just telling me you know what how's it, everything was doing and I, I mean i'm playing football which I, again i don't think i'm no big deal but those guys respect that and um it opened up some doors for me and he's yeah. just sitting there talking and he's telling me that you know he, he does something associated with racing probably 320 330 days a year mm-hmm. this guy was constantly wow. on the go and he's such an ambassador for the game or for the for the sport and he kind of probably made it what it was and and people adored him i mean they loved him mm. And unfortunately, he, you know, he uh, died, you know, not too long after that. But it was always neat to go in there and just see a guy not so guarded. Because a lot of these guys will be guarded because oh, they just, yeah. you know, they're, 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 they, you know, it's not that they don't trust people, but they're just, they're guarded because, you know, they just don't know what's going on. They want to get back to what they need to go. Yeah. But this guy was, it was one of those play times where, you know, you could tell he was totally relaxed. He mm-hmm. wasn't looking at anyone. He was doing what he needed to do. And it was just a nice conversation. But He's as big as they got, you know, as a sportsman, especially yeah. in racing. He was as big as it got. It was a neat conversation. It really was. That's uh, the beauty to it, man. Just being able to have conversations with these people that you, like, look up to or, I don't know, just have a lot of love or excitement in meeting or whatever. It's just, just these natural conversations with people. It, it drives the world, in my opinion. Like, just <laughs> being able to have these just open, nice conversations with people you really respect it does a lot for like the gears in your mind as well. It like almost lights a fire under your ass. Like now I have something more to achieve. Like I see what they're doing. You get to pick their brain a little bit. Now I have something a little more to work towards. It just, I don't know. It's, it's such a great creative outlet to talk well, to people like that. Well, yeah, you know what? And we can learn so much from so many different Absolutely. I agree. Yeah, you can learn so much. I mean, it's funny. You guys come here to interview me and I learn just as much from you guys as maybe you learned from me. And that's the need. If people open their minds to anything, anything yeah. is possible. And, Unfortunately, we close our minds to, you know, you know, what we are sometimes, you know, our own, you know, nationalities, our own races, our own religions and yeah. stuff. But if you just, you know, what opened up your mind and just had an open mind to it, you will understand that there's a great big world out there that could give you some wonderful experiences. And you will see that there's not many differences. Everybody yeah. kind of is looking for the same thing. We're all looking for a purpose. We're all looking, you know, to be part of something greater than self. We're all looking for, uh, you know, the answers to, you know, what we're, you know, and we all want, you know, different, ex- you know, I mean, it, that's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of life. That's yeah. the beauty of football because it extends that opportunity quicker than just about. I, I mean, I don't see a game out there that's that does as much, for their athletes as football does. I just don't. I agree. I don't. And it does so much for, I guess, everybody involved in that. Like, it, it shows you, I guess, the pathway going forward. You said you were always able to really connect things in life back to the game of football, and I think it helps you almost in all aspects of life. Well, yeah, we have an entry point. You know, we all have an entry point. For me, you know, it was football. You know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that something – else can't have an entry point for Absolutely. you uh, and, and for but it depends on wh- and what you're trying to get to um it, life is so amazing if you want it to be mm. it really is and trust me i'm sitting here and i've had my issues i mean yeah. i i've dealt with you know depression anxiety you know some other things um you know of course i have the physical ailments my shoulders my knees my, yeah my hips uh you know it, it, it all hurts you mm. know what uh um, quite frankly, um, <laughs> I don't remember a day without pain in my life. It just didn't, you know, it, it, it is what it is. Yeah. It's what happens. Um, Alignment in life. Well, that is. <laughs> it, 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 you know, listen, we all have to go through. And 
everyone shuns from pain. Everyone shuns from, you know, uh, suffering sources. But it was the pain and suffering that brings you so much. Um, you know, the sacrifice. I mean, everyone knows if you're going to be a good weightlifter, you're going to have to go through some pain and suffering. It's what, you know, your bo- your muscles are going to be sore. Your body's changing. You know, there's a, you know, there's a pain to it that it happens. You know, the big saying in football was always no pain, no gain. And, yeah. you know, that was great, you know. But, so, but there's also a thing that says, you know, the other side of that, which you have to kind of put, you know, um, in perspective was, because, you know, no pain, no gain, you know, we sometimes we would associate success with pain, but you're not supposed to be in pain in everything you do, you know what yeah. I mean? But, it's, it, but it does give you a great value. Uh, and there's so many things that people are afraid to experience a little pain and suffering, which to me, I think that's the key to it all. I think a little pain and suffering is what opens up the, the doors for you. It, it gives you a, a great opportunity and you know what it convinces yourself that you know hey it's not as bad as we think it is absolutely and we could move forward and get some good things done i mean i'm sure it's a little pain you know in the butt to bring all this equipment up here to set up i mean it's it's a little pain you know painful it doesn't necessarily have to be a physical pain Mm. but it could be just like hey i'll have to drag this up here to the third floor and put this but you know what the end result is yeah yeah man there's beauty in the struggle yeah, there is definitely, and that's a great way to put it—the beauty and the struggle. Um, but so everyone doesn't. Ha- it does. It's not. You don't want it to be hunky dory every day because it's a process. It's yeah. a process, and it's a journey. And you know what? People always think about outcomes. If I could tell you one thing that you should never do is you never should put out an outcome on anything you do. And the reason you don't is because if you don't meet that specific outcome, you will see it as a failure. Yeah. Mm. And it's not going to be a failure. Just because I've, you know, we ended up losing a couple games doesn't mean there wasn't some great value to what that, mm. you know, what we did. We prepared the right way. We got in shape the right way. We did the right way. And if you fall up a little short, hey, yeah. you ran out of time, so be it. You know what? You get up, you know, and do it the next time. You know, there's great value in that stuff. And some people just don't see the value in that. I think some days, you know, these kids today and younger you know, people today, they see that ESPN highlight and don't understand what exactly goes in that eight second clip. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of, you know, preparation, a lot of hard work and a lot of dedication, a lot of sacrifice along the way to get that, you know, eight minute clip and mm. show, you know, everyone thinks they should take the field and should be able to do what they just saw on TV. Yeah. And that's not how it works. Um, so you go do, and don't be afraid to, you know, what, uh, make mistakes. Yeah. Hey, we, you know, everyone, everyone knows there's no greater, there's no greater experience and no greater learning experience than making a mistake. Mm. Uh, you know what, that's how we learn, you know, what, you know, that's how we learn many things. You know what, uh, what I guess, you know, it's funny, you, you throughout history, you see people of all aspects and all different fields, and they'll say, listen, well, I just, you know, made a mistake and learned not, no, no, not how yeah. to do something. But there was great value because in that mistake, you may have learned something you wouldn't have learned mm-hmm. before that. Mm-hmm. And But like I said, take away those outcomes. Forget outcomes. Yeah, you know what, we all want to win. And, and, and you know what, that could be your goal. Yeah. But if you don't may have that outcome, you know, and on top of it, you might miss something with the outcome i'll give you a perfect example if you want to win the lotto you know what hey i want to win the lotto i want to change my life i want to do this you know what and that's you know that's it i gotta win the lotto and then all of a sudden you don't win the lotto you know the outcome's not there you're done but during that time you have you may have just got your dream job that's going to pay you a lot of money yeah well, can't you just say that, well, I did win the lotto by getting this dream job that's going to pay yeah. me a lot of money? Now, I would see it that way, but because if someone shuts their mind to it and it's not the winning, I didn't get the winning ticket, that means I lost. You know what? You're yeah. gonna, you, you just screwed yourself because you won. You did win. You, I, I look at life this way. I mean, I, in many ways, you know, with what I've gotten recently, you know, hey, we all want to win that lotto, but yeah. I, I have won that lotto. Mm. It just didn't come in the form of a, a lotto ticket. Yeah. Mm. One more thing I wanted to ask you, man. I guess we can kind of close on this is being that you've lived a lot of people's, I guess, dream or like kind of like you're saying, don't set an end goal on it. But making it to the, the NFL and playing in the league is like something that kids across the world, not only America, they dream of doing one day. How important to you was just the journey of achieving that dream rather than just the end goal of making it to the NFL? Mm. Well, you know, I look back at it now, and I know it was all the journey. Yeah, uh, because we rushed through the journey, we we missed mm-hmm. stuff. 
everyone wants to get to the end and 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 cause like you know like they want to get to the final they want and i would challenge you to say to yourself listen slow down live in the moment Mm -hmm. you know be mindful get all your senses in there together and don't rush it because you know what well, you talk to most of the players. It's not, you know, the the game that they miss the most yeah. in many ones. They miss compete. They miss the camaraderie mm-hmm. of the locker room. They miss the opportunities we had when we out. You don't, you know, necessarily go and talk about games. You're talking about times you went out to yeah. dinner. You're talking about times you went on the road. You're talking about times that you know what you hooted and hollered in the wee hours of the morning. You know, enjoying each other. You know, yeah. his company and you know what getting a little loaded sometimes. <laughs> yeah, that's what you enjoy. That's what you, you, know, you miss. You miss the fellas. You miss the guys. Yeah, we all like to compete. But I could guarantee you for offensive linemen, we don't miss getting the shit beat on us every day. Yeah. That's not the way it works. But we miss each other. Mm-hmm. You know, we miss being with each other. We miss being in the locker room. We miss hanging out. We miss that camaraderie that, you know what, that, that only we could have experienced. Yeah. And so, you know what, don't rush the journey. Be, because, you know, next thing you know, it's going to be over. Mm. It's going to be over, and then you know what? You're on to the you know the next journey, and um, you know it's been it's been fun. I, and I will tell you that uh, I could say this. I mean, football has given me so much, but football doesn't define me. Yeah. And it, I would tell you that if people think about me and just think about you know football, then I really haven't lived a good life. Mm. Uh, I'd rather people to think of me as a godly man, a God fearing man, a man that. Uh, you know, was a compassionate man that was friendly that also would uh, help his fellow man. Yeah. And so um, if I could do that because of the game of football, then that's what I want to do. And uh, football has opened that opportunity for me. And, and you know what? I try to live my faith through what I do. And um, it's been wonderful. I mean, yeah, there's some heartache. Um, you go through some heartache. You're going to yeah. go through some loss. You're going to, you know, you know, experience every emotion known to mankind. Mm. Uh, I, mean, I used to think getting angry was mad until, you know, I sat down with a therapist and they said, hey, listen, angry's, it's not, angry's not a bad thing. What you do with anger is a bad yeah. thing. And so, you know what, that's, you know, <laughs> of course, the Hulk, you know, you know the Hulk statues are all, you know, they're sitting around here, yeah. you know, reminded me of that. And plus, I was a big Hulk guy growing up, too. But, you know, so, you know what, you, you, you learn all this stuff and, and, and you just move forward. And like I said, you go back to what I said about the dynamic cat what's the best version of myself and what do I have to do to get there? Mm. And, uh, boy, is it fun. It is a fun ride. Even after football, it's still fun. I know. Listen, we're supposed to go, like, like I said, to, uh, Va- Vegas, uh, at the end of the month. I yeah. mean, I, it, it's going to be like, we're, you know, back playing, uh, but we get to watch. So we don't even have to, the pressure of going out in the <laughs> yeah. field and performing. We just get to watch and enjoy, you know, the game from yeah. a player's perspective anyway, just a former player's mm. perspective. And, you know, I, I talked a little bit about Steve Wisniewski. I mean, Steve is such a great man that he's, you know, he brought a lot of us back together, especially, um, you know, with the COVID stuff. And, and you know, really, it helped all of us. It yeah. helps all of us. We look forward to go. I, I belong to a Michigan feed with former Michigan players, uh, you know, high school feeds, with your former GAR players. And you know what? It, it doesn't change. You, 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 could see, you could see it, you know. You could see a guy for the first time in 25 years, and then you'd be like, "You saw them yesterday." That's how it, how it works. Yeah. So it's it's you know the journey, man. It's and guess what? And I will always believe this. And if I don't always believe this, I still believe after 52 years of you know, of good things, some bad, I still believe my best days are yet to come. That's that's so important. Yeah, man. And I do Amen believe that. that my greatest contributions are yet to be. Yeah. The journey's still like there's still so much time left, man. It's it's nowhere near over. That's yeah. the that's the beautiful part of life. There's always a new day. Yeah. Tomorrow. Well, you know what? It's the you know, great. Yeah. The great you know news is that the sun's gonna rise the next day. Yeah. Hey, it might be a little cloudy in one day, but guess what? The sun's still there. Yeah. The sun's there's still there. Always potential to make yeah, whatever yeah. day you're living a, a great and beautiful day. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine what you guys as Mohawks did when you had to wake up being a Mohawk. Sheesh, man. It's a beautiful way to live. Yeah, it is a great way to live. I can't imagine how sad you guys were. I mean, we were the hill. Yeah. We were on top. We were over, you know, we were on top of you guys. We overlooked you guys. So, I mean, I know what it was to feel like a grenadier every day. That yeah. was like, I never even thought, 
there was uh, unhappiness in life. I would have been fine to conquer, you know what I mean? <laughs> Posted nah, the flag on that one. We definitely did. Uh, and believe me, both of my parents were the GR, so I've had to hear that one my whole life. There you go. Life. But <laughs> thank you so yeah, much, man. Thank you oh, so man. much. Great stuff. Thanks for having yeah, me. It's great, man. I, I really, really appreciate you taking the time, you know, showing, yeah. giving us the opportunity to be in your house here. and Beautiful place. Be yeah. Yeah. Thank you. God bless you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, man. And anything you ever need uh, along your journey, if you ever need our help, if we could do anything for yeah. you, contributing or whatever it is, we'd yeah. be more than happy. Anything you, guys, you got going on, like, uh, in the future, or do you have any, like, social media oh. pages or anything? I forgot to say, I think you should write a book. You think so? I think that'd be so cool. <laughs> like a, All like guys a, in your position. Like an autobiography or even yeah. just something that you're, a, you're like, an expert in. Well, I, I got think a, you should write a book. I got some things, you know, written down, a lot of things written down. And yeah. I, I, I always wanted to. We'll see what happens. Mm. But uh, should do it. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that. And uh, I want to thank you guys for allowing me to be on. And uh, it's reciprocal, too. If you guys need me for anything, and I mean anything. For sure, man. Yeah. Don't, don't hesitate to call. Um, if you need me to make even try to make connections for you. In That'd terms be awesome. Of, uh, that would be sick, man. You know, some... Uh, some new interviews and stuff like that. Yeah, I will do whatever I can for you guys. I mean, yeah. even though you guys are Mohawks, the Grenadiers <laughs> will, will, will comply. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, cool. man. Yeah, that, I, there's this ancient proverb that goes that uh, every man in his life should do three things. He should have a son. He should plant a tree. He should write a book. Because all nice. those things will be here when he's gone. So yeah. I think you need to work on that book, man. Maybe get a tree out in Wilkes Barre City somewhere. Yeah, we're yeah, outside no here doubt. in the yeah. square somewhere. Yeah, I like it. I like the proverb. That'd be oh, great. Man. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, man. We really appreciate it. Again, great. this has been All great. Right. All right. Podcast. Boom.